Hello, hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. Welcome to all my vibe ranters. Oh, <laughs> Michelle, Mario, you guys don't have to scoot closer together. We'll just be smaller. So welcome. We have found yet another excuse to get the Astro Herbalism Dream Team back together. Really happy about that. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about the Elder Tree. It is such a robust and powerful plant ally, disciplinarian, healer, teacher, that it's deserving of its own entire episode. And so, you know, on that note, please put it in our ear if you can think of other good reasons why we might get the whole team together. Really excited to be with all of you again. Kyle making it all the way from his Italy vacation. So it's 2 a.m. for this guy. What a champion. Feeling the energy with the friends. Burning the midnight olive oil. Very good. Glad you're here. Michelle and Mario wouldn't be an Astro Herbalism show without you two. Slick Dissident wouldn't be a vibrant without you, except last week. How dare you? <laughs> Just kidding. And we also have special temporary guest, Emily Ridout. So Emily's a great friend, an astrologer, yoga teacher, blends the two disciplines, also happens to be quite the folklorist. So she let me know about an offer that she's got for uh, the Interverse community. And I told her, why don't you just pop in for a few minutes at the beginning or the end of the stream and let people know what, what's up with that and maybe sprinkle in a few elder thoughts along the way. So I'm going to kick it over to you first, Emily, so you can let people know about what's going on. Thanks so much for that chance. And also, it's so good to see every single face that I'm seeing right now. What a joy. Um, and you're right. I do have some thoughts on the elder tree, actually, as a, as a folklorist and with um, the many master student projects I watched on fairy folklore, um, I, I do have some thoughts. Um, but before I get into that, I do, and I'm so grateful for you for wanting to share this, I do have an offer coming up tomorrow, which is a class or really just a one hour session on the astrology that's coming up in 2024. And this is just an overview of the astrology that you can expect. There is some heavy hitting astrology in 2024. Um, I'm sure it's on the minds of many. Um, and some really interesting even astrology beyond the regular solar system and zo zodiac belt astrology that goes into our positionality in the galaxy and beyond. So there's some cool stuff. And everybody who signs up for that will get their full written 2024 forecast for their chart. Um, I gave Chance a code for three free tickets. So maybe he'll want to throw out a few to some of his people. Um, and if you don't happen to get a free one, it's just $20 for the class. I'm doing this sort of as a service. Um, the $20 is for really the time it takes for me to draw up those reports. But I am so excited to talk about some of the um, deeper themes in the astrology this year and to help people kind of make sense of some of the things which externally in the broader culture may be appearing as chaotic, um, but that can actually wind up being a really grounded expression in you. So um, Chance has the link for that, or I can pop it in the chat if you want. Um, Just did. Oh, sweet. You're so And lucky. as far as the, uh, the, the free tickets, I think I'll give those away at the end of the stream. So people hang out for that if you want to get a, potentially get a comp ticket to Emily's 2024 astrology class. I'm tempted to steal it myself, honestly. Please, please do feel free. They, uh. The offer went to you first. So. I'm giving the I'm giving the first of the three to my wife if she wants it. So nice. <laughs> let me know, Jen. Nice. Please do. Um, so so that's that. And anybody who's interested in it, I would so love to have interverse people there. I feel like you guys are always so aligned and um, aware of what's going on. Um, it can just be good to know some of this stuff. And I'm so stoked to hear about your astro herbalism episode. I'm like, actually, I mean, I love teaching yoga. I'm a little bummed I have to leave and go to my class tonight because I would love to just sit here and like 
get get kind of deep into that because um, the Saturnian nature of the Capricorn season, um, Capricorn itself and the lore associated with that, you guys are probably going to get into the lore associated with um, Judas Iscariot and the sort of proto-European Catholic association with this tree, I'm guessing, and also, of course, the very deep sort of fairy folklore from the British Isles and beyond. Um, I know because I've listened to each of you before that you probably already have a lot to say on that. So I just want to add in something that maybe would be useful for you um, that I learned in folklore school, which is that people who analyze folklore, and I think it's applicable in this modern age when uh, pop culturally, you see a lot of discussion surrounding aliens. Um, there are folklorists who have deep study in the concept of that fairy folklore, which we don't get as many modern fairy stories, actually got translated into alien folklore. And there are people who have these unifying theories um, where they even do such work as compare fairy abduction with alien abduction, um, the physical descriptions of the fairy um, from size to facial structure. And um, some of the projects I've seen on this have been quite uh, delightful and compelling. So as you're looking at the folklore surrounding the trees and the connection it has with astrology, um, I think it's interesting that the Fae are in some way, at least um, linguistically, etymolog etymologically, and um, narratively tied um, very deeply to these, these modern day contexts. And um, that can be pretty cool to think about. It's definitely on our minds. And thank you again for the, the kind offer, Emily, to let me share a couple of freebie tickets to your astrology class. I'm sure that's going to be really helpful. We talked about it last Wednesday, 2024 astrology, but you can't really ever get too deep <laughs> into that subject. There's always a lot of perspectives you could take. So I'm going to go around the horn. Kyle, how you doing over there? Good. I was just uh, trying to redeem my trying to redeem this <laughs> offer. <laughs> Sorry, I was off in another tab there. <laughs> I'm excited about what you're uh, offering here, Emily. Thank you. Hey, I'm doing good, man. I'm uh, coming from 2 a.m., but my body is still, it's just, I've been over here in Italy um, for two weeks now, but I just have been um, running my business and everything back home too. So it's actually not hard for me to, uh, day walk in and out of sleep, especially when it comes down to hanging out with my friends and speaking my mother tongue about well, you just came off of having an infant. I mean, within the last couple of years, your baby's getting bigger, but I'm sure you're, you're pretty accustomed to the weird sleep schedule. Yeah. He's, he's almost two and he has not slept more than three and a half, four hours straight. And since, since he was born, so it's actually, you know, it's no problem. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked. I get energized, really fired up talking about plants. I get really fired up hanging out with y'all and I'm excited to be back. It's great, man. And, uh, there's elder trees here. There's plenty of, uh, plenty of fodder for the, for the fire. And maybe we'll get into that too. We, you're not actually supposed to burn it, or maybe you, maybe that's where the name elder comes from, but it's a fun, fun plant to talk about. And, uh, I'm, I'm stoked to be here. What's up? You're going to have to let me know what happens when you burn it because I did that earlier this year. I didn't know it was a taboo. <laughs> Exciting. Um, I, I got one, one more thing to say. You're always uh, um, singing praises about my work, and I just want to say to those of y'all listening out there, um, it's a new year. Let's start, um, start it out by sending our, our guy Chance some super chats. Keeping, you know, we, it's not like we just show up and throw down – the best show on YouTube. It takes a lot of preparation in the back. He's, there's a lot of things. StreamYard, the thing that we're we're on here right now, that even that has a fee. So, helping our guy out, throw some super chats in, and Chance is always uh, super appreciative of that. And uh, 
that's it also makes the show more fun when there's when we can see people supporting in our community too so that's yeah, all. yeah that does build up the energy thanks for saying that kyle also people if this episode wets your whistle for elder knowledge i'm sure if you go over to the root radical podcast kyle's solo show and find the elderberry episode which is one of the ones he's put out for free you will catch things in there that either got said and maybe went out, went you know in one ear and out the other or things we didn't get to in this talk but kyle holds it down for like solid 80 something minutes solo talking about the elder plant and that's what inspired me to get into this with everybody here tonight it was such a great episode so make sure you're subscribed to root radical podcast if you want to keep the herb knowledge coming and now the m's my favorite m's michelle mario I feel like every time I see you, I, I, I realize how much I miss you. <laughs> I love you guys. Oh, shucks. Love you too, man. Love this crew. Nice to see you. Love you too. Love you all. Yeah, we're uh, stoked to be here and talk about Elder. So uh, I know Michelle has a, a fondness for Elder and uh, likes to use elderberries and things like that. I feel like it was one of the first sort of remedies that you really gravitated towards early on in your journey. And uh, we got some snow today, so it's feeling very wintry <laughs> over here in these parts. And uh, we're kind of bracing uh, to get more over the next few days, it looks like. And uh, yeah, I have a few new wrinkles related to Saturn um, that I've been getting off my chest. And I'm stoked to get into that because I think Saturn gets a bad rap, you know, in so many ways. And um, I'm kind of just tracking the information that relates Saturn to being a, a really uh, a positive planet, um, ruling a golden age, and actually being related to uh, a lot of northern symbolism. And so you know I have to bring that out. But uh, yeah, man, thanks for having us. And I'll hand it off to Michelle. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Chance, for having us as well. And yeah, Elder has been one of my uh go to since the beginning and i know kyle mentioned that mentions that in his episode of root radical for elderberry too and i think that uh it's it's kind of a go-to for a lot of people for good reason and we're going to get into it tonight but we're actually enjoying some elderberry and reishi syrup right now so that's a typical uh remedy that's always in the fridge here at the house and i have a fondness for elder and the folklore around it the medicine the feelings i have with it the connections i've made and the emotional support that comes from this this uh, tree as well as all the medicinal properties and uh, i just i love saturn and i love capricorn and i love winter and cold weather and um it all just goes together so well so looking forward to seeing what we all throw down i am too and you know, when Kyle mentioned the preparation, I maybe did just come to this show, <laughs> like just shooting from the hip, but I've been deep. Gabe knows about it. I've been deep in the sauce, drowning in gravy for days and days. I think that I put before today, today I didn't get to it, but before today, I think I spent three solid days straight just preparing for the next marvelous demystifier show. And I'm not even fully there yet. There's so much in this next one. I can't wait for that. So a little teaser. We'll be doing that soon, probably outside of a regularly scheduled day, just so I can start unpacking this massive weave. Gabe, how you doing, man? Welcome to the Vibrant. Good to see you, buddy. Chance, you are a walking embarrassment of riches, my friend. <laughs> I hope I could rise to the occasion with all your work you put in, buddy. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. I'm very excited. Yeah, uh, I'm doing wonderful. I had my first live feed last night. Uh, I was just messing around, trying to like, you know, like go through YouTube and see what the paperwork I got to file here. And the first, you know, Futsen, it told me, oh, we got to, we got to wait 24 four hours to schedule you for your live feed and i'm like what no but then i'm looking at my camera and it looks like it's broadcasting but it's like pointing down not up and i'm like oh no am i have i i've been recording I, while i was filling out the forms on youtube on my phone i thought maybe i was broadcasting so then i scrambled and the next thing i knew i was broadcasting on a whole second channel so i had a false start I had a, and I, uh, <laughs> so there were some people actually sitting in my waiting room and I did this party, uh, but I do enjoy it. Uh, it was really fun to like, 
interact with everybody live. I had as many as 30 people in the group. So thank you all for uh, entertaining me. It was uh, it was great. It was a, a really good time. And it also, it allowed me to like spend all the caffeination of anticipation that I thought would be on demystifiers. I just went live and talked to myself for two and a half hours. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> yeah, thank you all for joining me. And uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Yeah, I've, I've been teasing Gabe like, okay, we're doing it today. Oh, no, we're doing it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely going to be a two-parter, uh, but let's get into some Capricorn and some Saturn talk. Uh, I'd really like, you know, while we have Emily here for a couple more minutes, if maybe Mario and Emily could bounce around some of their current thoughts on Capricorn and, and Saturn, maybe uh, starting with Emily. So, and I wish I could stay and listen so much longer, but um one thing that I think a lot of people maybe who aren't just so deep into astrology don't know, but could know about Saturn in particular, is that Saturn rules the sign of Capricorn, and he's also the traditional ruler of the sign Aquarius. These two signs are opposite of the signs ruled by the sun and the moon. And so if you look at this, there's actually an ancient alchemical knowledge hidden in this, which um, the metal associated with Saturn is lead. And so when you read alchemical texts, they, they speak a lot about turning lead into gold. And it's like, okay, well, you know, our chemistry brains are like, well, how do you do that? This doesn't make sense on certain levels. But if you consider the idea that Saturn is associated with the root chakra and um, the gold or the sun is associated with certain, so the pineal gland and the moon, the pituitary gland in the brain. Um, this is actually talking about the rising of the kundalini and the, um, the metaphoric um, enlightenment spoken about in alchemy. And so Saturn is really the key, the starting point and the foundation that must be in place in order for all of these associated enlightenment quality is to take place in the body mind. So that's just my really quick two cents on um, Saturn. Excellent. Yeah. So like I said, um, kind of where I'm at right now is peace out, my... Emily, Emily right out. Oh, she's taking off. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Okay. Some yoga. Bye, Bye, you guys. Check you later, Emily. Do it yoga. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> For everyone that one. missed the beginning, at the end of the show, I'm going to give away a couple of passes to her uh, 2024 astrology course that's happening tomorrow. It's an hour call that you guys can join. It's only $20 to join. I'll put the link in the chat again. Uh, and Emily is a total badass. <laughs> great astrologer. Great, great yoga teacher. Good friend. So, yeah, Mario. <laughs> back to you buddy oh yeah 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 no i just want to say man you truly are one of the most supportive people um you know on camera and behind the scenes so uh just much love and respect to you you you've been you know always there for us you know ever since we started getting online and talking about all of it so i know she appreciates it and uh you're the real deal that way so it's really cool to see um but yeah regarding saturn so saturn obviously as she mentioned generally traditional generally traditionally associated with lead uh, i think of the color black i think of the fact that saturn under the traditional system is the furthest planet out and so it takes the longest to do one full uh revolution uh 28 years i believe and so it's slow it's lumbering it has those rings associated with father time um chronos right things of that sort where I'm currently at right now is I'm just really appreciating the fact that one Saturn uh, apparently was the ruling planet of the last golden age. Very interesting because you wouldn't necessarily think that based off of, uh, you know, the paintings and illustrations of Saturn eating its children. <laughs> As an example, uh, generally Saturnian figures are old. Uh, they have big beards. They carry sides, um, very much associated with things like the sickle as well. And I am really trying to 
just understand the fact that some cultures have viewed Saturn as being uh, very feminine as well. And so perhaps kind of its earliest sort of expression or understanding was more feminine. And so, you know, can you name any of the cultures you're thinking of? Just, I'm curious about that one. Well, well as an example, like uh, Kali is one one such example of like a feminine Saturnian expression, right? I think a lot of actually like crone symbolism in general. Crone-os? That's exactly right. Yeah. So to me, I just look at the landscape right now with astrology, symbolism, things like that. And I'm like, where is the crone right now? Where Where is her wisdom? Where, where, uh, where is she at? Where can you learn more about her? And I would say, I think where you can learn more about her is through Saturn. And so I think it's our perception of Saturn has changed over time. And so what I'm kind of concluding right now, at least my working sort of thing, is that Saturn has been around long enough to have been completely flipped and changed over time. Potentially from a feminine expression or perhaps it was more mercurial. That's another thing. As I've been putting out content related to this, some people have said it's actually more of a sort of uh, whatever you want to say, binary sort of deity, or it's androgynous, or perhaps there's a, a triune sort of aspect to Saturn, kind of like Mercury as well, right? And so that maybe this has always been the case. And in the modern world, in the modern solarized world, in my opinion, living in the solar age, that its understanding has been kind of uh, transferred over to what we kind of uh, view it now. But I think that it was way more benefic, and now it's turned into a malefic planet. And then I think there's something to be said about this gender sort of swap as well, that perhaps it was more so related to the feminine, which makes a lot of sense because the other thing that I've learned recently, uh, there's a fantastic author, I've been shouting him out. His name is Rene Ganon. And he is one of the clearest authors with world axis polar northern symbolism that I've come across. His work is absolutely incredible. Uh, I can't believe I haven't found him sooner. I, I've seen his name referenced in a number of symbolic dictionaries over time. It took me a long time to finally get around to reading his material, and I am absorbing as much of it as I possibly can. But he says that this golden age was a hyperborean northern age so this means that saturn was the sort of ruling planet during this polar um tradition this northern tradition and so i think the flip maybe had something to do with the solarization of everything um living now in a solarized sort of world where the shift has changed uh the symbolism has changed from a polar understanding of things to now a solar understanding which is also very interesting too because saturn according to some people uh was the original sun that's kind of a, a theme or a myth that's been perpetuated over the years that he was the original sun um and then we were talking about s-o-n or s-u-n right so saturn kind of reminds me of almost uh, i was telling michelle this yesterday of almost like the first child in a family to go through all of the different phases of life right uh to go through uh puberty to go through uh you know adulthood have children you know to reach middle age to become an elder this is what saturn's story is saturn is the first one to have gone through all of these different phases in life through all of these different transitions and i would say that there's something about him being related to a central pole or a central axis or a supreme center and then moved away from it over time but that's his journey you know so he's been around long enough to go through this major sort of transmutation um, from perhaps being a uh, a god of the golden age to now you know a lot of people don't really want to uh, acknowledge that there's a lot of really beautiful positive aspects related to saturn it seems like there has been some sort of distortion or whatever over the years i love it man that's a great breakdown uh, as somebody who has had uh, unexpected experiences where like psychologically Saturn left the scene and all the boundaries between things got blurry or non-existent and hard to tell where I begin and the world begins, <laughs> I'm glad for Saturn to yes and what you're saying with the potential of it being a sun in a golden age. I love to think about that theory that I bring up sometimes, which holds that the what we call Saturn and Jupiter were actually once a, a a Mercury type of planet and it was 
<laughs> so like the earth grows and new rings of land expand out. And so it, at the dawn of time, there was just one luminary and it was kind of like a perpetual twilight or perpetual dawn. And then as the earth grew, it split and became what we call Saturn and Jupiter. And then what we call Mars and uh, Venus became the next, it was a, a single thing. And it, it was the new middle of the world, like, like polar luminary. And that split became a new sun and moon of a further out ring land. Then we get, <laughs> then we get Luna and uh, soul, what we currently have, but as a single being, and then that splits and we get Mercury at the pole. Mercury at the center of the world, I, the planet we call Mercury. So I think all of that is really interesting to consider. Also, there's, of course, just going to be overlapping symbolism with any of these characters. Saturn, his depiction is the old man, but also sometimes benefic, could also easily relate to the idea of the the sun in winter. <laughs> I know Mario is not always about bringing things back to the sun, but it's a yes and, not a only that, right? And... Then, you know, the, the last thing to maybe pile onto that with the, the flipping of genders, I've really been entertaining the idea lately that in history, there have been a lot of religious wars, history that we don't know about, that cults dedicated to the phallus and cults dedicated to the yoni at war with each other, then maybe coming back together, being a dual principle type of cult, and then going back to being at odds with each other and their deities getting flipped around gender swapped as it goes uh someday i'll present more about that once i can maybe wrap my head around it but i think well i think we need to give kyle some some floor so that he can uh build build up some steam over there in the three hours of the night i i loved what you just threw down about saturn mario that made perfect sense i was um i was thinking how how do i uh rectify the um, electric universe cosmology with like a geocentric cosmology. And I think that you just did that like really well with that little explanation about that, the stages of growth of the luminary. And that makes, that makes sense. Like, you know, of course an archetype can grow today. I saw Mercury and Saturn hanging out. And, uh, so it went like this. So first of all, um, it was about 1030 in the morning and you heard bong, bong, bong. And that's a public notice in the village. Everybody around here is centered around the central pillar, which is the central axis, which is the church bell. And that's, and that public notice ringing somberly three times uh is telling you that a male of the village has just died if it rang twice it was a female um, unless you're in one of these woke priestly districts where they're like oh we're just going to do everybody three um which is a thing now apparently but anyway the three the three bells that's that signifies that and to me when i heard that tone immediately i knew i was like the undertaker's coming like, like that's the same exact tone from uh, listening to uh, wrestling when I was a kid <laughs> and I wasn't a wrestling fan, but I loved wrestling because wrestling fans were retarded. But uh, as somebody who could appreciate the, uh, the, the play and the inner workings and the characters and the story and everything like that. So I loved wrestling, but not as a fan. And also like, to me, that's a great reference point for like, you know, politics and the feuding bloodlines and everything, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, you know, it's, it's fun. So, uh, there's, there's, uh, Saturn with his comp, his, his mask. He's the comedian and, or, you know, uh, Capricorn, you know, ha has a lot to do with like comedy and tragedy and everything like that. So there's the, there's the mask. Uh, there's the play, there's the public notice. It was about right now. And, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's all good. And, um, and uh, so I go, we're, we're out on a walk, and as we're going on a, on a walk, uh, the hearse drives by, and it's this freaking Maserati, like $120,000 hearse or something like that, like just badass car. 
And I was like, wow, that is definitely Mercury rolling <laughs> with his boy, Saturn. And, uh, <clears throat> and my wife, Serena, she goes, in Italy, when a hearse goes by empty, which it was, the men touch their balls. And I was like, oh, okay, no problem with that. I'll touch my balls. And because uh, it, <laughs> it's like, Mamma it's, mia. Yeah, it's like, a, you know, it's like bad luck to uh for uh, a hearse to go by and not touch your balls okay so we got to touch your balls and uh let's bring and that into said, fashion here and then she says uh then she says uh toka ferro which means touch iron and that is the um that's the cultural expression for we say knock on wood right when, when uh i don't I, I don't want anything to kind of go wrong so they say toka ferro which is touch iron and that reminds me that like, I was like, oh, this is a great sync because we're going to be talking about um, the fey folk, the hill folk, the elementals, the spiritual beings that live inside the sometimes called fairies that live inside of the elder tree. And what are they, what are they opposed to? They're opposed to iron and these types of metals, that type of iron in particular, that scares them away. Do you think even calling them fairies is like invoking pharaohs? the iron wow that's a real that's a really i so that's this is where i'm like i don't even know if fairy is the right word i like to describe them as elementals i think that they're they have something to do with like the spirit the spirit of air or the spirit of earth or a combination of those two things like that's where they like to live and i mean just tracing back knock on wood like if you i don't know if you just do a tertiary look on it they'll, they'll probably say something like it's to scare away the spirits um, when you when you do that, like you're scaring away the spirits, just like a bell, just like um, the iron and stuff like that. So I thought that was really cool. My experience and so, with spirits is that they knock. They're the, like they're the ones who knock in my life. I get like a lot of confirmation that I'm bumping into some kind of like a auxiliary extra extra bonus uh, consciousness and a tuning ceremony will be. I like ask like are you there and then the wall will knock right next to me so maybe that's why we knock on wood it's like to reply yeah exactly like yeah we're like uh all right i'm in i'm entering into this sacred space i became i became aware that i'm no longer in my mundane walk down the street you know like i, I i've i recognize that so i'm going to touch this pole <laughs> which is the first thing of iron i see there's a pole on the street after I touched my balls. And then uh, now automatically my mind is propelled into this magical, mystical underworld place where all of these spiritual things are kind of set up like that Maserati was supposed to go by so that I could talk about that today and uh, all that stuff. So I, I don't know. I thought that was really cool. Mercury rolling with Saturn. And so it, rem it made me think just like even – even um, thinking about Saturn, Mercury is the messenger. So when Saturn has something to say, the bell strikes. Like that's Mercury being invoked for our public notification through Mercury, right? Like there's the information. It, it comes from the messenger, there's the message, and then it has to be interpreted. And all three of those things is, is the mercurial, uh, is a, like a little mini- uh, triune within the greater triune that Mario was talking about. And well, I've got all this Loki stuff on the mind and the alpha and Omega of that arc is Mercury becoming Saturn. Like that's the entire story is Loki starts off. Mercurial becomes Saturnian at the end. Very interesting. Totally. Yep. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I, so, I know you and uh, Gabe have covered too. We got to tag a Gabe in. He's chomping at the bit. Go for it, dude. <laughs> oh, hold on. Can you hear me? Am I good? Yeah, I think I'm thinking very much about irony drawing out desire. And can you hear me? Am I okay? My screen's going weird. Here, we hear okay. You. Am I back? Okay. Irony drawing out desire. Oh no. You're still here. There it is. Prince. 
when you when you say like um you're drawing you're, you're playing foolish so that somebody will correct you and when they correct you they're showing their hands and they're showing what they want and this this desire is in greek it's the erotes and there are different flavors little different characters of desire and so i think that in a spiritual progression in the public where a a, a funeral is going by a parade the this is wotan's um march this is the great march this is the great hunt this is the um the caravan, the Pied Piper, there's so many myths here and so many spirits and superstitions in the flow of this progression that I think it makes wonderful sense that people are practicing some form of spiritual sanitation uh, to keep themselves sound, to preserve their sanctity of, uh, uh, it's, it's hygienic, it's spiritually hygienic. Something has to be observed. I love that it's a gesticulation that you have to do a gesticulation. That's what we call these these little symbols and pantomiming that we do. Um, and it it's literally in the word. There's such a fun pun in ge the word gesticulation. It's ghost and uh, expression. It's a spiritual uh, expression articulated, you know, spirituality articulated. Um, and then one more thing before I go out and get all weird with the signal. You said mother tongue. You said mother tongue earlier. I just want to put, I want to make note of that word. What a great word that your home language is called the mother tongue. I think there is a strong um, placental nod into that, uh, the spiritual significance of that phrase that you use, the mother tongue. Uh, I think that's really great. It's like a, it's like you're coming back into a comfort zone. The word comfort zone is a placental nod. Uh, and it's on my radar in a very raw way right now. I'm so placenta rich right now. Everybody be careful. The fragility is, uh, is, is peaking uh, in my, uh, in my work. I'm focusing on what it, the Norse call it a filja. And I'm realizing that the, this filja is the placenta but it's also uh, fragility. And this is the heart of the mater. And so uh, uh, I just wanted to kind of put everybody in my mind space and let you know that, that fi the figures of speech and sign language, in fact, are really impactful on our aura and our sympathetic magics. And I'm, reason I'm reasoning and realizing that even sign that sign language is speaking on a level to the aura on a sympathetic level that is um, that has to do with a mother tongue, a mother tongue that we know, that we all know. And uh, it's like an inside joke in this group, but like uh, these gesticulations say so much more than words. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, and then, oh no, I won't. No, I won't leave it at that. I got one more before I forget it. Uh, uh, Emily earlier, she said uh, she calls herself a folklorist, a folklorist. Local forest, the spirits of your local forest might be very familiar with your local folklorist who might know exactly what's going on in the elemental realm of your neighborhood. So a local folklorist and walking maybe with them through the forest might be a great way to heal. Beautiful, beautiful finisher to your weave there. I feel like it's Michelle's turn to bring it in. So Michelle, maybe this would be a good time to start to weave the elder plant into this whole picture that we begun painting the outlines of, you know, I feel like it's a puzzle and we just got all the borders of the puzzle found because that's uh, where it's wise uh. to start and Saturn being borders, you know, that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, yeah, your journey to elder as a, a very useful teacher and ally and what what has it taught you what is it good with yeah great great question and anything and else you want to talk about <laughs> yeah this is great already by the way as i knew it would be and i love that connection gabe the uh folklorist with the forest and it makes me think of a florist where we're dealing with flowers and anyway that's where my my mind went but that was great 
Um, yeah. So the elder, well, one of the things that I wanted to put out there because you asked about burning the wood. And so one of the myths around that as to why you're not supposed to burn the wood, it's said that one who burns the elder wood is opening the possibility of the devil coming into their home or the possibility of being bewitched. Now that's like part of the folklore of it. Um, but there is a lot of connection with the, um, the burning of, of wood in general and elder, and there being some sort of lingual connect connection with, um, the word, the old Anglo root of elder could be from Eller, which means to kindle. And then also, as Kyle mentioned in his uh, episode, um, and as we've talked about in the past, the hollow stems of the elder, um, they're not hollow necessarily when you cut them. There's like a soft pith in there that you can, you know, hollow out, but you can turn them into billows for a fire to either stoke a fire, st restart a fire, you know, burn a fire stronger. So I also think about the fire connection with the fire, fiery realm of hell or whatever hell looks like at least the hell that we're sh we're told how it looks is that it's a fire a place of fire and burning and torture and all this stuff like that so the the fire connection to me is kind of interesting and i don't know i i think that a lot of this stuff is metaphor as well and i think that there could be some kind of thing going on with the bewitching of burning elderwood that kind of is connected to a lot of the uh quote unquote poison plants where they're usually connected to the devil but they're also connected to the altering of consciousness and those shadowy realms that we can swim in when we're working with these plants and so i wouldn't be afraid that you've invited the devil in <laughs> but that is one of the things about it uh when it comes to that but in terms of my introduction to elder medicine it came when i was working at an herb shop in portland and i was actually an intern at the time and i was tasked with bottling elderberry syrup for the day that i was there and I had actually never had elderberry syrup before. And so I was bottling the stuff and I'm like, wow, look at the color of this. Oh my goodness. And I, I was like, I have to taste it. And I just took a little shot of it and I was just blown away with how delicious it was. And I'd never tasted anything like it. And I just was like, oh my God, I love, I love what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm just going to keep on doing this. <laughs> and here I, took I am. I two shots of elder <laughs> syrup today. It's awesome. Oh it man. It's great. It's it's incredible. And one of the things too, like living out in the Pacific Northwest, our native elder tree is the blue elder. So it produces blue berries. I mean, they're much bluer. They're more, they're, well, the black elderberries, deep, dark purple. And then you have the blue elderberries, which we work with out here, which makes a lighter shade of like purple when you make the syrup. And there's also red elderberries, which usually aren't used for medicine because a lot of times those are a little more toxic but you can use um you know the leaves and the bark of that tree but a lot of times it's kind of caution to not use the red elder berries but one of the connections i made with that that all three of these elder plants of those colors it's all related to blood and i always look at elder as a, a protector of the blood a mover of the blood then you have that uh, black color that comes from the black elderberries which can signify moving stagnation or if there's any kind of like rotting tissue or you know things like that just the, what dampness can kind of bring and I, I i think it's really cool the coloring of all these elders and how connected to the blood it is and all that sort of stuff uh one of the things i'll add real quick uh regarding the fire connection is that uh like the aztecs like their elder they call grandfather fire and so there's a few cultures where their oldest deity or wise person was compared to like an old flame mm. and, and they're, they're compared and likened to fire. So that's their elemental correspondence. Although they relate a lot of things to fire <laughs> and a lot of things to the sun, but there is that. So I don't know, something worth chewing on, I guess. That's a good one. Oh yeah. Like the ancient Persian s uh, priesthood would have like these towers that at the top there was a fire burning at all times that they 
pretend came from the sun itself that like the sun deity gave the priests the fire and they keep it alive so it's the exact same fire and it must never go out the, yep. uh, yeah exactly the ogum the the ogum ohm alphabet there's um. the yeah there's the uh, a straight line and four uh cross um uh, all the way across this the the stem i guess you could say of the of the line that is corresponded to elder and it's called r u i s it looks like ruiz i think it's called rush and um that means reddening so i from i've been studying the ohm a lot and what i've been learning is that it's not necessarily there, there you go yep uh, i said four but it's five i guess there yep and um what i've been learning is that i think commonly it's presented as an alphabet of trees and i think that that's partially correct but i think that what they were it could also represent uh an alphabet of commerce and an alphabet of like I think that these these same letters can represent animals in the marketplace or can represent textiles or fiber, but they also uh, are recognized in the way that people would regard archetypical things found in nature. So that might be one of the more truer representations of this uh, alphabet, but you'll but from what I've understood, it kind of has uh, it depends on who's making the conversation with who that would be the reference for the trees. Um, so it says, it, it says on this page, I just pulled up that the Ruiz is associated with the idea of like divine inspiration. Is that how you understand it? Yeah. Ex that, yeah. That's that aligns perfectly with the, my understanding that Agam is the same alphabet, at least in the letters in their order and the number of letters as the Hebrew and the Phoenician and a bunch of other systems. The uh, because the Hebrew ruach, which is the same exact word as Ruiz, it's just mm -hmm. S and C interchanging or S and H, which happens all the time. That's the Holy Spirit, <laughs> the breath of God. It's the pneuma in Greek, it's the aura in Latin. Very interesting that that's coming into the weave because I've been like really deep into that idea the last couple of days. Well, let's let's talk about the Holy Spirit because to me the Holy Spirit is the small still voice that occurs from nature. Like that's where I find that's what the Holy Spirit is to me. It's nature. Um and uh the signatures that your that you know we decode or that when we when we're looking at these plants that is a confirmation of the Holy Spirit the signatures that are present in the elder tree are signatures relating to the expiration of oxygen from the dark berry and the alveoli that are in the lungs so it, it's right there that is your that is the inspiration the divine inspiration please give that divine inspiration to me holy spirit <laughs> And you see it right there in the in the in the berry, the uh, the the eldest part of the elder tree, and uh, I mean the the berries that they're on this. It's called a corum. It looks like a little umbrella, and um, they start to pull the tree down, and it hangs down like Saturnian signature there too. This is a picture from my garden, actually. This is great because we could see the mutable uh, qualities from the flower. The, this mercurial maiden stage that lifts up and then the the berry that pulls itself down it pulls and mario and michelle produced this great video this little three minute video on, on youtube with beautiful aesthetics showing not only the signature of it pulling down but also how that relates to the the, uh, the arch that you see in the saturn signature or saturn symbol as well so that's beautiful i mean does that not look like uh the the venous part of the body this is what i would would also call the feminine part of the body so i i think about this tree as a uh it's it's coming from like the the point of the the oxygen has is now has ne like a more negative charge it's looking for that positively charged potential it's from the periphery of the body and it's moving its way back to the lungs for that divine holy spirit once again and um not only not only that, but the 
the mother of the of the fairies or of this of this elemental spirit this opening or the portal that we see along with the hollow stem that we've talked about as well all of that is suggestive of that crone or that feminine aspect of saturn embodied in the plant even the the way that you harvest the berries from my understanding the you want to wait till they're at the very last minute <laughs> i mean essentially the their value is in the the very end phase of their existence on the plant right like you don't really want to get the berries too early so it's that crone moment or old old moment is when they're best picked yeah but you can't sleep on it because the uh the birds want them too <laughs> i have a couple of uh, elder trees in my backyard actually and they just crush turns out missouri is the potentially the best climate for elderberry or elder trees in maybe the world and it's for people out there maybe got homesteads or just a backyard you know that's a huge untapped potential market i i happen to know multiple people that have small plots of elder trees they barely need any maintenance in, ter in terms of like keeping them alive it's more just like pruning them back and they find manufacturers of elderberry products to just sell their harvest to and they make a little extra cash every year the the fact is at least last time i looked into it something like 30 percent of the domestic elderberry usage for the united states is actually grown here but our climate at least in the midwest especially missouri is the best climate for it to grow so there's a huge potential for expanding this plant's presence at least in the you know the commerce world that could be mutual beneficial there's there's something more about just the climate like uh we're talking about saturn we're talking about boundaries elder plant the elder tree loves to grow on boundaries. And so when, when I'm thinking about Missouri in my time that I spend there, there's a lot of farms. And I think one way to um, distinguish my piece of grass from your piece of grass is, uh, you know, the old hedgerow, which is years ago when I planted the trees I've got, well, they're, they're bushes more like, cause I always prune them down, but I planted them right on the fence row. Like they just grow right along the fence perfectly on the boundary of my backyard. I had no idea about that back then. It was just the intuitive thing to do. It's like it, it, it wants it. Totally. That's where they thrive. It's said too, that if you put them too close to the house, um, they actually have a really spooky, they have a really spooky uh, leaf shape in the, in the shade. And so it's, so some of these lores, um, I got a book as a gift from one of my friends, Nausicaa, who might be listening right now that's uh, under the witching tree and it was a gift because michelle talks about this book a lot so this is a really cool book to highly recommend it beautiful chapter on elder and in this book um yeah really nice really nice photographs in there too great great writing highly poetic lots of interesting um uh so i brought that with me and i've been i've been diving into that book but in this book, um, I forgot where I was going. Oh, yeah. She describes that when the elder is too close to the window of, of your house, that it like that it like looks in. And it makes me think about like that this plant is kind of like a carrier for, again, these elementals, this fairy spirits, the the um, that you, there's in order to have a symbiotic relationship with them, you keep them in the garden. You don't bring them into the house unless you do it so ceremoniously, which happens to be like a lot of the Yule type customs of bringing in uh, a tree or evergreens and then taking them out after a certain time, after 12 days of Christmas and so on and yada, yada. Um, and so having like a little springboard for ele elementals to just look inside your house and peer inside your house will, will, uh, will be bad luck. And furthermore, um, you're not supposed to have any for form of elder in involved with like child care. Like you're not supposed to make any el elder uh, toys for your kid or elder um, uh, elder cradles or anything like that, because that 
<laughs> the fairies will either abduct your kid, <laughs> so that's not good, or they'll come in the middle of the night and they'll pinch them until they turn black like the berries. <laughs> So that's not good either. So make sure, make Is sure. Is that where the idea of feeling something uh, and pinching it comes from? Mm. That's probably not the case, but <laughs> it's made me think of that. Yeah, like pin, like you pinch. I'm just pinching a little from from your bag or something like that, right? Like, right. It's probably yeah. more of like a cocaine reference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not doing drugs. <laughs> No, but really, that's a joke. I'm just doing some calamus root. I'm not calamus doing drugs. Root. You're doing drugs. Calamus root, it looks like white powder because it is, but it's totally all natural herbal. Yeah, calamus, calamus root. Calamus root makes you holler and a hoot and improves your memory. It's my favorite plant. <laughs> seriously i love calamus like when i first started using it the taste was really intense and now it's kind of like you know somebody that doesn't drink coffee they're like ew, that smells horrible and then a coffee addict is like that's the best taste ever as soon as it touches the lips that's me and calamus root and it's like yeah, it's like the cheapest or it's not expensive at all it's a great it's a great daily dose love it secret weapon you know, uh, one of the things that I love about elder too, one of the folklores is uh, sleeping under an elder and it produ helping you produce prophetic dreams. And so there's a lot of myth around being under an elder or being near an elder at certain times of the year. Um, and the way that the elder does kind of grow, how it does grow towards the the older growth kind of comes down and towards the towards the earth, it creates almost like this cradle or this natural arch. That's really nice. And where our elder is, it is along our fence line as well. And it's along one of the garden paths that we have. And it it is just like kind of creating this beautiful arch, you know, that it was natural, it just kind of started happening. And once we built our... Uh, dead hedge fence it's like this perfect little elder portal when you walk through it and it's it's just this really nice comforting feeling that I get from it and I love also the myth about there being a witch that lives inside the elder and that you are to ask her permission to harvest anything from her to harvest the wood the berries the leaves the roots anything that you were to harvest that it is you know pretty important to ask. And I almost look at that, you know, I, I kind of use that rule for all plants kind of thing. And it's kind of a good practice to do, I think, but for the elder particularly. And I think it's because of all these like darker lores around it that it's almost kind of like forbidden, but it's, it's so uh, nutrient dense and helpful that I think that's one of the reasons why there is so much of this lore around it. Like it's kind of like, it wants to be mysterious, wants you to kind of poke and prod a little bit more than just kind of taking it for granted sort of thing, which also reminds me of the energy of Saturn too, because there's always that element of the harder lessons in life are, you know, sometimes uh, not as fun to swallow, but they're usually the ones that are most valuable. And I feel like that's kind of where Elder is at too. It's so valuable for so many things that it asks for a little bit more respect in order for you to kind of play with it and work, work around with it. Yeah. If you like go Googling it, you'll probably get some warning, arsenic, toxic, poison, yeah. death, bad. Yeah. And that's typical for all the ones that are really powerful, <laughs> you know, as we've talked about on multiple vibrants too, of like a lot of these plants that are deemed poisons or whatever, uh, you know, kind of like poison prescriptions from the seed sisters that you, uh, graciously sent me chance, uh, you and Jenny for Christmas. That was, that's a great book so far. I'm really liking it. And, you know, they talk about that of like these forbidden plants or whatever. Um, they're the most potent, they're the most strong, and they usually have the most lore around them. And I think that they really want us to know them, but they just really want us to respect them and understand that, no, 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 we want you to utilize us, but we just need to be utilized with more caution and, and more care really. So one thing that's coming into my mind right now, because we've, we've got the boundaries, we've got the, 
like the the skeleton, you know, the form of things that Elder expresses in its signatures. But what about the Saturnian idea of authority? I've told this story before. I'll, I'll do it briefly, but we were bringing up earlier the lead question <laughs> relating to Saturn and my personal experience as to why or, you know, to confirm the lead association with Saturn was uh, a tuning I did one time where we were dealing with problems this client had with their knee, a lifetime of like multiple knee injuries and the stuck energy at the knee level pertained to uh, authority struggles with this for this person's life as a pattern struggles against authority and struggles with their being challenged by authority, not taking their own authority role or, or stepping into it, things like that. And I even <laughs> happened like sometimes I'll draw a tarot card to help me understand what's the nature of the stuck energy for this spot. Like what's a little more specific. I drew the devil card, Capricorn, Saturn, and then, and then this, this uh, client revealed that she had uh, mysteriously had lead poisoning in her life a couple of times. And I was like, whoa. So I'm wondering if <laughs> lead, you know, is there any possibility that that elder would be a medicine that helped with that type of thing with the uh, lead exposure or if there's anything about its signature that suggests that it has uh, something to do with authority, like spiritually or energetically to help us align with it, help us fit in with authority in the natural hierarchy, help us step into our authority in our own hierarchies, stuff like that. I, I don't know about the lead thing specifically with elder or elderberry, but this is a, a perfect weave to bring up, man. Um, it reminds me of, um, you know, the, the phrase we're saying bending the knee. Right. And so when you bend the knee, that means you're being subservient to somebody or you're not really in your own authority or power or whatever. And you we didn't say, but Capricorn rules the knees. That's absolutely to right. Make sure everyone gets that. Absolutely right. Yep. And so um, Saturn, as it relates to authority, uh, one of the things I've been chewing on is the fact that Saturn is exalted in Libra. So Libra, the scales, justice, lady justice. Right. Um, and to me, symbolically when i think of authority i think it really much of it goes back to um the world axis actually and so shocker <laughs> but uh you know when a king or an emperor or a queen when they're holding a wand when they're holding a scepter if someone's holding a staff right this is symbolic of their power you know this is symbolic of of their backbone you know this is symbolic of their sovereignty or autonomy Right. And by extension, I'll say like in the tarot, the wand, right? The, the wand is a directional tool. So if you watch a movie and there's magicians and wizards and things like that, and they cast a spell, they're going to point the wand in the direction of where they want to project their magical energy. Right. So wand symbolism in the tarot, I see it that it's related to this idea, but I also see it as a uh, weapon as well. It looks like a baton. It looks like a bat, right? It's it's a club, essentially. You can use it to defend yourself or your family. I also think, though, probably the most practical sort of correspondence with this is that the club is also a, uh, a tool uh, for disciplinary purposes for self, you know, saying the things that need to be said doing the things that need to be done right um speaking up um and uh basically kind of taking care of your responsibilities right and so discipline has been something that i've struggled with my whole entire life because i'm way more right-brained artist sort of guy i want to stay up late and i don't want to have a schedule or anything like that but there's something to be said about having the right amount of discipline um in order to kind of have that freedom you know, to be able to do what you want and to be a little more carefree and things like that. Um, I've heard as an example, David Lynch, um, he apparently has a very strict schedule for himself. Um, and he, he's a pretty strict person when it comes to how he structures his day. Um, and apparently this whole logic is so that 
he can be really disciplined in his day to day, but this allows him the freedom, you know, uh, his uh, freedom of uh, creativity to be really far out and out there in his movies, in his scripts, in the different ideas that he conjures up, uh, conjures up and creates, and everything else. So there is a relationship between discipline and freedom, uh, but I see it that the Saturnian symbolism, as it relates to authority, right? It's like. Um, you know, in its best light, if we're looking at the modern day Saturn as being a uh, a father sort of figure, father time, you know, uh, the father brings tradition, the the father brings structure, the father brings um, something that's grounded, it brings stability. That's what the world axis represents. The world axis is the point of pivot for everything, essentially. So including the stars, you know, uh, in the heavens. And so it relates to the point of pivot that gives order. You know, we did the presentation uh, a while back now, Order Ab Chao, and I talk about the fact that chaos, you know, preceded order and that the world axis brought about order. It brought about something for everything to revolve around. And so what I said earlier, and I'll just get into it very briefly, but uh, some people say that, you know, the solstices and the equinoxes correspond with different directions. And as of late, I've been reading about the winter solstice corresponding to the north. Makes perfect sense. Where does Santa come from? You know, what, what's Christmas all about, right? What's the new year all about? The Gregorian new year. You know, it's essentially a winter solstice celebration, basically. And so Santa comes from the north. A lot of winter symbolism is related to the north, right? Um, I know some northern can't traditions. Can't forget that Santa's an anagram for Satan. <laughs> no, no, no. You <laughs> can't <times>. forget that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> for sure. Uh, some northern um, peoples see seven reindeer, you know, when they look at Ursa Major. Not seven anything else. You know, there's been so many correspondences to Ursa Major now. It just, it, it makes my head spin. It's absolutely wild. In fact, it seems like that's kind of the thing is that you have a local correspondence for it, you know? So right now I'm getting into this whole thing about it once being a boar in the Eastern world and that that transferred over further West to a bear. And so the author Ganon, once again, was saying that this is uh, why we have Borea, Aurora Borealis, Hyperborea. You know, that this Boro, boar. Boros. Yes, wow. there you go. Yep. Perfect, dude. I love that. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So boar to bear. You know, he has a whole uh, essay about this. From the wild boar to the bear, I believe, is what it's called. And he talks about this whole entire transition, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, but I see a lot of northern symbolism baked into Saturn and what it represents. I think of the rings of Saturn as well. When you look at a circle or you look at a ring, there has to be that central point, right? Um, there is that sacred center right there. There's a supreme center, you know, in any shape that you're talking about. So even when you're talking about the square, there's a fifth point. It's right there in the middle, right? And so I think of the circumpunct, the circle with the dot right there in the middle. That almost just looks like a glyph for Saturn, <laughs> right? So if you look at Saturn from the top down, there's the rings of Saturn and then there's the planet right there in the middle. And, um, you know, there's a whole thing about, to the Aurora Borealis hexagon on Saturn as well, <laughs> which is pretty interesting to think about. And uh, I just Googled imaged it recently, and it was still, like, kind of blowing my mind that this is even a thing. Uh, but there is a polar aspect to Saturn. That, that's pretty much what I'm trying to say. And so uh, I think the pole is one of the perfect sort of symbols to equate to authority, including your authority, your own authority, which is basically your backbone, symbolically your backbone. But it's your center, right? It's your point of perspective. It's your opinion uh, and all that kind of stuff. I have a thought about the lead poison. Let me, throw one, let, me, let me pile one on just before you go, Michelle. Yeah, Mario, you ever thought about the Latin word for lead? It's, it's plumbum, which Ooh. basically mm -hmm. a plum is a type of measuring tool to see if something's like straight and level, but it's like uh, a weight <clears throat> on a string, very much like, um, what do you call it? A pendulum. It's like a plumb line. Plumb line. So that like, why is the word for that related to the word for the old word for lead? You know, that's a question. Well, it's funny. It's center. 
in Freemasonry, they acknowledge the plumb line as a world axis symbol. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. lead. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. 100%. Totally, totally. Good stuff, dude. Yeah, there, there's a whole, there's other things we could talk about with this, uh, but that is fascinating. I love that. Thank you. One of the things I think about with the so, uh, the lead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Slick. You go. Go ahead. Well, just on the phone line, as soon as I heard it, uh, can you make me big chance? There is a plumb line encoded in the Wheel of Fortune card. Can you see this metallic spear? It's on a string off the card up above. And the plumb line is measuring. This is a pendulum, right? This is a kin kin kinesiology, kinesiology. And of course, we have the X, you know, the 10, the deus ex machina, the big god crane that resolves all things at the end, you know, maybe a promise for return of the golden age in here, um, you know, coming from that uh, Saturnian, uh, what do they call it? They call it the, um, the purple dawn, the eternal purple dawn of the Saturnian age. It's all kind of intrinsic to this card, but do you guys see it too? Do you guys see the plum on a string and it's determining what is a right angle to make sure you can start building a city? Or a structure. I totally see it. And this is all. Okay, good, good. And this also, just so everybody knows, uh, this determines a right angle. So we're going through a right of initiation because 10 is a reset. It's completion. So we're going through a right, right, right. <laughs> 10 equals one, right, right. Okay. We can all agree. Okay. Uh, but this is the card that was turned into a hang glider and sent into everybody's imagination to spark off world war. The shape of this card was depicted as a hang glider in that 2012 Economist magazine cover. If And I've literally, if you come over to the Slick Dissident, I'll show you how you can turn this card into a hang glider, colliding with BB Netanyahu in a cloud of wrath that overlays onto the sun card that has the same numeric value as this card. So this card and the sun card are colliding like hang gliders in a cloud of wrath. Wrath is the number one position on the Enneagram. Interconnection overload. All right, yeah, Michelle. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, one of the thoughts I have with the uh, lead poisoning and the potential connection to elder as well um well it makes me think about the elder's ability to help the body detox and that being one of its main uh methods of helping us uh that's you know it's always known for colds and flus and and things like that and this time of year to help your body kind of move stagnant fluid and stuff and so what if the elderberry elderberries or the elder tree in general could be the antidote or a helpful ally for something like lead poisoning i think that it would just basic it wouldn't hurt that's for sure because it would literally start to just allow your body to start purging things that it doesn't want to have within it um and uh i'd love to hear what you guys have to say about that too but you brought up wands and then i can't not think about elder wands and i know kyle knows all about elder wands too but uh as soon as you said wand, i'm like oh man it's just like on so here we go elder wands and uh, lead poisoning and let's go <laughs> Kyle's Kyle's weave on the elder wand was the moment in his uh, root radical podcast where I was like, we got to talk about this. I just want it just want that one piece of gravy. <laughs> the okay, so we've we've mentioned the witch, we have to lay this foundation down. So elder, it's, um, it's, it's mercurial in that there's the there's the flowers that are light and the berries that are dark, we got light, we got dark, we got this tree that's medicine, but maybe it's poison. We got a tree that's sacred, but maybe it's cursed and evil. So all of this uh, um, mercurial, it's, it's like it's like the plumb line has already made its its uh, its furthest points all across the the page here for our for our weave here. Uh, the the dryad or the spirit that lives inside um, the sacred mother, or the witch, uh, whatever tradition that you want to 
come at it from if the word witch triggers you then think of it as a, a sacred crone the mother the tri the dryad but for for whatever reason you know when the christians came in and they said uh oh they're using that as a, as a medicine we better uh, call it the devil or something like that so her name is hildemore h-y-l-d-e-m-o-e-r sometimes it's called holdemore and holdemore in um in germany they're still called holdeberries that's what they're still called holdeberries so holdemore and uh more represents uh is, is uh signifying mother more mother hilda is representing the hill folk or those elementals the fairies the fairies fairy spirits so hildemore hill, hill folk hildemore more holdemore voldemort voldemort the um the elder berry looking bad guy <laughs> that uses what does he use what is he always after he's after the elder wand for because he's up to no good well actually i went on to harry potter wikipedia storyline blah 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 and wasted a few minutes today looking up the the uh, backstory of the elder one according to the um canon narrative and it, bef before you know uh the good wizard what's his name dumbledore before he got it knocked out and stole or whatever he made one of his like first initiatives of good magic with this is to light a fire that would never end and so that's just going uh back to what you were saying before chance about um uh, customs that were that had something to do with um having a fire in the tower that would never ever end and so that's what he did with his el his first order of business with his elder wand so yeah the elder one you can and it's fun you can make your own elder one but the thing is is that um because there's so much power and energy in this plant historically is it the, the i mean the question becomes like is it an egregore because culturally it's been like applied or are people seeing something and they're just relating the story either way you better be careful and really communicate that with the tree before you just start cutting it and and um uh trimming it i feel bad for some of these arborists that are just like you know, listening to podcasts and smoking cigarettes while they're doing like cutting down sacred trees in the, in the city, you know. Um, <laughs> but somebody's got to take the curses off of us. So thank you to them. But anyway, yeah, so you, uh, you can harvest a little bit of uh, the elder tree and you can actually um, uh, make your own little wand. And that's really fun, too. You can also like we were talking about earlier, you can hollow out the pith and blow and make an eller, which is something to start a fire or a flute elder an elder uh, whistle an elder flute a lute this is all pan mercury saturn saturnian stuff right there too built into the tree so yeah eldermore hildermore voldemore that's the that's the i i felt like um what's the author's name was really i don't know if she was just like keyed into lore or if she's just keyed in to if she was getting i don't know what the deal was but my my opinion on the matter is what y'all discuss in your marvel demystified series is that when when uh somebody is in the creative process that the creator will just wink through and we will be able to find these types of things whether or not um the author of harry potter was uh was intentionally trying to uh, make these connections with nature, nature spirits, and Voldemort, or if that's just the way they came out. And so Chance texted me. He said, uh, according to Harry Potter um, uh, canon, she makes Voldemort as a Capricorn. And I looked it up, and the actor that plays that, uh, that role is also a Capricorn, and I believe he's got a uh, Scorpio moon. So he's like, you know, d double bad guy, perfect, ready for the. All the, the bad part. guys in Harry Potter are Capricorns. And uh, <laughs> except except uh, Ma Draco Malfoy, he's a Gemini, but he kind of flip flops back to good. So he's not like one of the villains. He's good at heart, like Geminis tend to be. But I, what you just said is so key, because when you look at J.K. Rowling's presence online or outside of her Harry Potter books, 
it just doesn't seem like she's got the esoteric knowledge that is encoded in that work. And it's deeply encoded. I actually listened to the audiobooks early, uh, last year, went through them. Again, it was a great blast from the past and the childhood. And with modern ears, it blew my mind. And I went through and looked up the birthdays of the characters. And like most of the heroes are Leo, which makes sense, obviously, or the main character. <laughs> And the bad guys are mostly Capricorn. Uh, so anyway, there's there's a lot there to to like the Harry Potter series. Totally seems like either the creator winked through or there was a think tank of initiated people that used Rowling as like their front, you know, their their figurehead. It's got to be one. Well, and the third possibility is that she actually knows the stuff and just never, ever acts like it in any way. <laughs> well, I, don't, I have nothing against her, by the way. Uh, but that Holdemore, Voldemort, it actually in the audiobook, the, the the reader doesn't even say the T, it's a silent T. So he says Voldemort. In language and philology, the H, the aspirate H, is in many ancient languages, is not its own letter. It just refers to how you push air whenever you're pronouncing something. So if we were to just drop the H and look at Oldemore. Well, a U is a V. Look at the Hebrew letter Vav. It can go, it can be either thing. They even look the same. So yeah, Holdemore and Voldemort are literally the same word. So that character's name means elder tree and he's got the elder wand. He's a Capricorn played by a Capricorn. It, yeah, that alone is like, <laughs> that was the million dollar gravy that I really wanted to do this whole show for. So thanks for getting us there. Nice. I got a I got an anagram out of Elder Wan, y'all. End of world. The end of the world. And that is very Saturnian, no doubt. But it's also at the end of the world, the spell is cast Alakazam. That's the end of the world, is the casting at the end. It's the period at the end of the sentence. And the period is the ultimate boundary. <laughs> uh, this elderberry weave, guys, is hitting very hard around Remdesivir. Uh, if you give me one R to L switch, I can turn L, uh, Remdesivir into Save Elder. And that's a fascinating fact. It brings a great amount of information to mind considering the lockdowns and who the demographics around that word. Elder is a, is a, is a salvator of the natural healing community. Elderberry is what people go to when they're feeling anything. It's the first, it's the first uh, uh, measure. And then save, it's almost like it was telling you, save up your elderberry, save up your natural medicine, save up your remedy, save up what the elders taught you because you're going to need it when you kick this medical system to the curb. Also, it's very triggering because there were a lot of elders in need of saving. Uh, so there are mixed messages, I think, behind the marketing of the letters that they choose to name that product. A lot of fascinating anagrams. Uh, it's kind of, I kind of creep myself out. Sometimes it gets too black pill. I'm like, nah, we're on a walk through the herb park. I'm not going to talk about what Remdesivir is whispering and subtly in people's ears. But that's one of the scariest, craziest words. And all along, it was save elder. It's damn triggering, I think. Uh, and it also comes very close to... Um, I'm seeing a lot of indicators uh, because of the Saturnian uh, um, aspect around it. Uh, Remdesivir was a challenger. And so that collect a challenger, like a, a, it was a, a nemesis to, to, an, to the world for a couple of years. So it was totally in the position of the Saturnian number eight controller position with that shadow of luster domineering. Um, but how do I want to say Gabe, this? Since, since we need Kyle, these things, we need these things. Well, you brought up Remdesivir and I'd really like if we could actually segue that into 
this conversation about elderberry being labeled by your <laughs> green allopaths out there that herbal allopaths out there that is antiviral because I remember during cooties, all of this terrain versus virus theory, germ theory stuff. And so much of it, just like that argument, that, that opposition didn't really do anything for me, but Kyle on your root radical episode in probably less than five minutes, you were able to paint the picture in my mind of the sorcery of virology better than anyone ever had in my experience listening to people talk about it. And I'd really actually like that because remdesivir being a labeled as an antiviral, but then people that worked at hospitals were calling it rim death is near because once you, once they're putting people on that, the next thing was a ventilator and the next thing was kaput. So anyway, elder being called an antiviral, what's the big misconception here? That, as you were able to explain it back in that episode with virology and maybe why someone would have that impression about elderberry if they were in the germ model. Um, so yeah, the, the question, all right, Gabe, you just blew my mind with the rim remdesivir and save elder. Um, because, because I, <laughs> and I think Michelle is, uh, is ready to talk about this too, is that back in, uh, at the very beginning of cooties, there was, uh, a, nobody knows anything. We don't know anything, but all we know is don't take elderberry syrup. <laughs> do you remember yes, that, Michelle? I do. And I, you are reading my mind. Thank you. Totally. I totally remember it. And it was, don't take elderberry syrup, cytokine storm. Oh my God. It's, it's so bad for you. And there was this whole campaign against it. So totally. thank you, sir. Yeah. Perfect. That's exactly yeah, what my, I wanted to say. <laughs> my dad got Can't, ill during all of that and he refused to take the elderberry. I think maybe he heard something like that, or maybe he just, you know, is averse yeah. to fruit. I've never seen him eat fruit. Lo love you, dad. You're great. But you know, elder syrup is, is going to keep you out of the hospital. Yeah, man. The Go ahead, uh, Chance, if you can pull up a full card, a uh, Thoth deck, and just flash it while we're talking, I'm sure Kyle's can weave on it too. There's there's that poke salad in the corner, and it's right next to a bag of medicine, and we all got fooled, y'all, and the elderberry got targeted. I'm telling y'all, this fool card is like the Bible to the Thelemic order of the entire world. They're all on board with this uh, Thoth deck. So, so we have the to, to just to go back to Chance's question here, and I was putting down a foundation is that. The elder, um, yep, there's there's the berries. There's the elder berries up there. Uh-huh. And uh, fool me once, you know, uh, we won't get fooled again, <laughs> as George W. Bush would say. <laughs> oh, I love that one. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, so, yeah, the, the idea here is, oh, wow. And... And this even has like the the arches, the way that the, the plant kind of like arches itself down to. Um, where where is the uh, poke salad that you were talking about? Oh, it's down there. And yeah, and there's like a. a I think even a the even the elderberry could be construed as poke. Yep, I think so. Yeah, they're 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 both kind of lookalikes, and so every every year on a. Uh, forums people will be like is this elderberry and it's it's clearly poke but um but anyway so all of that started out with the the elderberry is bad for you the whole premise of that is that our cells have receptors and that these receptors sorry about this light guys it's annoying um the receptors are uh they a, a virus comes along and plugs itself into the receptor like uh like my uh, my headphones plug itself into the headphone port of my microphone here, and if my head, you know if I'm using the the wrong receptor, then it's not going to be able to go in. Like that's the that's the whole premise of this biological model, and the problem is, and and they even named it. They're like it's called the ACE two receptor, and what the elderberries do is that they go into the ACE the ACE two receptors and uh, 
they downgrade the amount of um, outlets so that uh, your the the viruses can't find an outlet, and they're like, ah, oh, shucks. And then by then, you know, the immune system comes in with the baseball bats, and it's all war, and it's fighting, and we're fighting against these uh, these little plugs that are trying to plug themselves in. They're like dead plugs, right? So the problem is that the is is in the question like I, that was my model once. Like I have to, I accept humility in this. Is that like this is how I used to understand it, and this is how I used to explain it. And then somebody came along, Tom Cowan, and he said, uh, hey, does anybody, has anybody seen these <laughs> receptors before? Does anybody have, have any evidence of these receptors? Oh, well, <laughs> we can't see them. They're a theoretical model. You know, it's just math, obviously. And so <laughs> we can't see them. We can't actually, like, but how else would we explain how, um, so the way that viruses are explained is that the way that I like to think about them is that there's they're this dead entity, right? That's how they're this is how their official narrative, right? This dead entity, and it comes in it. And so I have one right here. It's a it's a, a zipper, and it unzips your the the, the mem membrane of your cell, and it gets inside, and then it and it uses the DNA and replicates and blah blah blah, and out burst a million, and then it keeps going and going. And so that's like saying that my zipper here, that the trouble with putting my coat away in the wardrobe is that I'm afraid that one of these days this zipper is going to zip off and it's going to go onto another coat and it's going to zip on and it's going to steal all the fabric from that other coat and it's just going to make another one and pretty soon one of these days my wardrobe is just going to explode. I mean, <laughs> that's the that's the prim that's like what we're given is that like this dead thing, right? And so the way that they find them and uh, they, they, so it's like, well, but that doesn't make sense. We have a, a field, it's called virology, and it's been scientifically proven. And so this is how they do it. Take some snot from a person who's exhibiting symptoms of detoxification. And we have to be careful when we jump to conclusions. When we say a sick person, that's already, that's already jumping to a conclusion, right? Like, let's just say there's a condition. Somebody has got some, somebody's hacking up something. So they'll... <clears throat> They'll take some of that snot and they'll put it into uh, a centrifuge, right? And they'll they'll centrifuge it out and then they'll pull out the little virus and that's it, right? No, that's not it. What they do is they'll take that and then sometimes they'll filter it out. Sometimes they'll filter out some of the other bacteria and dust and big stuff. And they'll just put all a, a lot of that unfiltered stuff onto a slide a lot, and then they give it in a, a culture. And the culture is... This is, tell me if this uh, doesn't sound like a black magic spell book where somebody's like sp spinning this cauldron over and over. And what does the spell call for? Uh, snot from somebody in China. <laughs> okay. And uh, kidney cells from a green monkey. Oh, well, we only have brown monkeys. It must be a green monkey. It has to be a green monkey because they're the most viable for our laboratory. Okay, green monkey kidney cells, okay, into the slide. And then that solution must be fed with the serum, the blood serum of a baby calf that has never been born and has not seen the light of the day. Okay, so now the, the typical solution is... It's not <laughs> kidney cells from a green monkey. <laughs> the green monkey, okay, there's another big thing there too. There's like homunculus uh, aspect going on right there. Then we got the baby calf and there's your placenta. And then out uh, from that, then you give it antibiotics, starve this thing. And the poison that uh, breaks apart in the in the the wardrobe, all of the excess little pieces of cloth that are in the cell, all of the little genetic material that comes out, take a picture of that. There's your, there's your bad boy. Boom, stamp it, put it on the news. Uh, of course, the scientific method would involve taking that further and then making sure that that will continue to infect another person. And, you know, they tried that back in time, but they found that that just wouldn't happen. They just couldn't do it. They did it over and over and over. And Alex Zek and the guys over at the end of COVID have over 50 examples of that uh, being used, but they never, ever, ever were able to conclude that those particles would. Um, so how is it that elderberry <laughs> is 
therefore helpful for people who exhibit these signs and patterns of detoxification if that is not due to a quote unquote virus well it's because <laughs> uh it's it's like as, as we've been mentioning before it's just helpful for detox improving the detoxification of the blood in the case of the uh lead poisoning it's improve improving the uh the viscosity of the mucus. So therefore our body can have its own way of moving things out um, of the lungs and th these types of places. There's a lot of ways. The, the dark colored berries are high in anthracinones, which are a type of uh, uh, antioxidant. Oh, cyanide, Cy cyanide, that's poisonous. Um, <laughs> so, so yes, it's one of the highest forms of anthrocyanones, which is a type of cyanide, yes. And uh, it's a good one. And anyway, that's the idea with, uh, with viruses and with elderberry is that um, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to just market something, right, on the bottle with our paradigm and just say it is anti because we don't like saying what we're for anymore. We like saying what we're against and uh the bad man it's the anti the bad man and boom stamp it on the bottle let me sell it okay i'm sold out it's a lot easier it's a lot easier to do that and it's a lot more difficult to um, stand in the difficult and uh maybe the the counter perspective of the paradigm and and really talk about and then with that it's fun because it opens up the possibilities again we don't know anymore we don't know. It's uh, it's helpful, and <laughs> there's a lot of ways that we can see why it's helpful, and there's also a lot of ways that we could see why somebody would go through this detoxification. And is it something that is um, preventing our body from manifesting that tox detoxification? No, that's what pharmaceuticals do. They stop the process. It's in it's aiding that process along, so that. When things are studied, like people had a cold and flu, and they when, when they took elderberry, that it limited their duration. It had only two days. Well, we can we can accept those results without necessarily saying that it you know was from a cold or a flu that somebody was just going through a detoxification event. So anyway, I'll let you, I'll let y'all weave in. I, I threw down some homunculuses and, <laughs> and placenta spell magic. <laughs> Double, double, toil and trouble. Yeah, I want uh, Michelle in here. You know, the, this whole question of the, uh, you know, they're, they're accusing elder trees of having witches in them, but the virologists <laughs> are the real witchcraft, at yeah. least in the negative black, black magic sense. No, I would agree with that. And uh, I mean, this is great. I, I mean, I, man, G Gabe, thank you for going there with the cooties uh because that was one when that came out when they announced that elder berries were dangerous and you shouldn't take them to help maybe prevent whatever this illness was which whatever i couldn't believe it i mean i just i mean it was laughable to me so it's very interesting but for me you know i too I look at all of this stuff as such a blessing because it really, really uh, made me reevaluate the way that I look at plants and the way that I look at my body and everybody else's body and what we really, what our bodies really actually do. And so I feel like if you were able to kind of use that experience of 2020 and take some wisdom from it, that was definitely something that like, I felt like really was an opportunity to up your game on understanding why, why our bodies work the way they do, you know, cause a lot of times you just hear, wow, the body is just such a, a beautiful machine or whatever. I don't look at it like a machine at all, but it has this just innate ability to heal. And that goes across the board for humans and animals and everything else that we're built to heal. And the whole anti language, 
uh, I've, I'm still working my way to getting out of that, of talking that way, because that is one of the first things you learn too. I mean, especially I'm sure, obviously allopath, that is like the main language, but even in herbalism, you know, uh, you hear it in books and great herbalists talking that way too, that I still obviously respect and have gleaned a lot of information from, but there is that, that was kind of one of my things was realizing just breaking away from that mainstream herbal weave as well because seeing the language and that a lot of those um, people even local herbalists in my own community fell right into the trap of the cooties and took the vaccine and shut down their shops and you couldn't go to an herb shop in portland without having your freaking temperature taken and wearing a mask and i was i was like taken back i couldn't believe it but then on the other hand i could so I love this type of weave and I think that it's really important for people to be talking about it because the anti thing is really interesting. And I love that point too, how you brought it up in your uh, chat on elder Kyle, because it is a thing. And uh, it's really interesting when you really analyze it of like, yeah, why is it that it's anti everything? I don't understand that. And it's just so, you know, ingrained in everything. So, yeah. Yeah. My two cents. Um, Awesome stuff. Love this weave. Very, very important stuff. Um, from my personal perspective, what I see, and I am not a health expert, herbalist, anything like that, but I see a parallel with the symbolism related to the conversation of viruses and what that means and represents and how nonsensical a lot of it is and heliocentrism. I, I see a parallel between what heliocentrism represents. You know, heliocentrism, when, when you change the cosmology or cosmography of a people, it changes their spiritual framework. It changes their psychology. It changes, you know, so many different things. And what I see under a heliocentric sort of worldview is that everything is outside of self. So you need an expert, right? You need external solutions. You need to get, uh, you know, uh, everything is seemingly not within. We're on the Innerverse podcast, right? Excellent name. I've always appreciated the name because really so many things come from within. And it's by tapping, uh, you know, into your sacred center, your true north. That's how you connect with the infinite. That's how you connect with the cosmos, right? And so um, with heliocentrism, Everything is about external validation and external information and everything else, but and, it never uh, intermediaries, one hundred intermediaries between you and whatever it is, yep. the science trademark, the doctor, the priest, etc. Exactly, exactly. So I see that with how we're taught about you know what viruses and germs and like how this all works, you know these invisible things that you'll never ever ever see, uh, none of us will ever see you know, haven't, uh, you know, they can't accurately even be uh, documented and whatnot. And we're believing, you know, these these stories that they can travel around the world and infect me. And then, you know, I can pass it to Michelle and she can pass it to so and so and everything else. And so to me, I just see a lot of the symbolism that's related to heliocentrism and 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 uh, all this viral business. And I see that there is so much overlapping symbolism, it kind of blows my mind. And it uh, kind of by extension, I see that a lot of the way modern people talk about aliens and things like that. Uh, Emily brought this up earlier about the whole Fey sort of connection, spiritual connection, potentially with what people might be seeing. Um, these invaders, you know, these invaders from distant lands, and and they come here via spacecraft and everything else. And uh, I just see that symbolically once again, uh, the metaphors I feel like are very parallel with how people in the heliocentric solarized world how they view ets how they view viruses and um i don't know there's just something to be said about that so that's kind of what i've been chewing on for a handful of years <laughs> ever since we've been going through all of this when you guys were talking about the everything being anti this anti that it's really lost on people that don't study language and etymology but anti as a pre prefix in the greek it didn't just mean against or something like that. It really meant more like the replacement of something, the new version of the thing. So like when you say, for example, the Pope is the vicar of Christ, the representative or like the, the replacement, the, the 
in a sense, the return of Christ or the, you know, in the place of Christ, that's a better way of putting it. Anti really means like in the place of. So by the, by the meaning of anti in ancient Greek, the Pope would be the antichrist. So whenever something's like anti, then something bad, and we're handed it to handed to us by the intermediaries, whatever version of the the corrupt priesthood may be, uh, presenting this poison as something good to us. You know, they're secretly saying this is the <laughs> this is what you get to bring. Like this is the new version of that thing bringing it to you in a sense. Uh, because when you consider to be against something, even in our understanding of the word, to be against something invites the energy of what is what is for it. It's a it's just a nature of reality, metaphysical truth that like if I'm if I'm pushing up against this wall, there's an equal force pushing up against this wall. So like whatever you're against, you're also for in a in a bizarre way you're like supporting its existence by being holding it in your mind and you know your weave about the heliocentrism as a metaphor for virology and for so many things that are the problem of our time with externalized externalized everything <laughs> is extremely extremely apt man there's so many ways that we could dig into that idea but um in particular, heliocentrism even has the word like heal in it. <laughs> you know, we're talking, the sun is a healer of sorts. I don't know. I have more to that, but it's kind of like ghosting out of my brain. It'll probably pop back in whenever I, uh, when I, whenever I stop trying. <laughs> right, right. No, man. Uh, maybe we can continue that conversation because I've always actually wanted to spend time and create a list or a presentation or something that kind of fleshes out this idea because i feel like right now there's a handful of loose ends with it i feel like there's something to it obviously oh, uh, i just remembered mario it's i think it's copernicus or someone like that you know ancient one of them old ass astronomers that's famous <laughs> but there's like a, fa a famous quote from maybe copernicus or someone like him saying along the lines of the heliocentric model that the Pythagoreans were so into is useful because it allows us to uh, calculate things often with accuracy, but it's just a model. It doesn't mean that's where we live. So <laughs> when you talk about heliocentrism, when you talk about virology, when you talk about almost everything, the science like astrophysics, outer space, et cetera, it's like, you don't live in a model, <laughs> you live in reality. And even if a model might have an explanatory power where it can predict some things accurately, uh, that doesn't mean that you live in that model or that that model is the absolute truth. Virology, it may, you know, that, that premise may be able to predict certain outcomes, you know, like if you create the witch's brew of, of fetal cells and weird pus and all the other shit that they mix in and then inject it into a, a laboratory mouse, it might not do well. It might react poorly to being poisoned. That does, you know, so you can, there's some predictive power to that. And, you know, there's a lot of other explanations that could, that could hold as true, true. Um, besides the idea that invisible demons jump from one person to another, I mean, germs. Mor morphing so, demons we don't live in a model but people do live in a model and like across the board there's so many versions of that people uh, associating with their straw man their not true self their external on paper self it goes on and on a million different versions of it so you know to whatever degree people you want to revoke your participation in believing that you live in a model and just exist in reality uh, that that uh, desire will reveal truths to you as you're ready to unpack them that are infinitely valuable <laughs> to put fiction where it belongs in the conceptual realm and exist in reality is infinitely valuable well put man the map is not the terrain uh slick go ahead yeah man uh over on the slick distant channel we like to say the word terrain is insufficient for the map <laughs> uh but uh i'm definitely picking up on 
uh, um, in the chat, somebody mentioned um, the Fauci of it. Fauci in reverse is I cough. It e even has an Italian accent. You almost have to do some sign language. You and you read his voice in reverse, so you sound like the guy. I cough. I cough. They are seeding our consciousness with the most playful, innocent, childlike fun. And if you can get in the spirit, you're going to see through everything they say in this state testicle manipulation is not going to fool you any longer. You're not going to play the state it's, testicle. I think it's God at this point. You're not point. going to fondle yourself when there's a funeral. It's cosmic it's consciousness. It's the funeral that progression that Kyle saw. It was he was watching a parade of dead people that was the this 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 march of the frenzies, whatever the Wotan on the march again, and he had to grab his testicles to shield himself from these bad furies, from these bad spirits, from these these maybe ornery little anteros. You know, anteros is a very significant a very significant erote we've been dancing around this whole time he is hiding inside of the word controller um but even while we're saying antiviral and, and all these things about being a space holder anteros is in a crucial spot between the eight and the two periodic symbol for lead is number 82 uh and if you spell his name if you combine the a and the e and you allow me a lot of fun Anteros becomes S A E T O R N. Setorn. Setorn is an anagram for Anteros. And he is between the eight and the two, the number for lead. He's totally Saturnian, but he's not Saturn. He's Saturn natured. He's keeping track of things. He's not that planet, but that is in his nature. He's keeping track of things. Uh, Okay, I'm going to weave on Fauci real quick. I'm just going to kind of seed everybody's mind for future, you know, you guys can all go on rabbit holes on your own with this. But that Fauci name, that Fang, it was seeded as far back as Machiavelli. And if you want to think of Machiavelli in the William Durant flavored Machiavelli and maybe get intimate with that guy, there's a lot to learn about that. But I'm here to tell you the word population in reverse is no. Loop, op, hold on, I got to write it down. Oh, no ital, loop op, no ital, loop op is literally saying, if you told everybody that the Vatican was running the world, they wouldn't fucking believe you anyways. They can't see this language. They can't see the wolf. So you can cry wolf all you want. The population has been programmed a long time ago not to see what you're talking about. No ital loop op. They're not going to see it, y'all. They're not going to see it. Uh, that's frustrating. But guess what? The boy that cried wolf. Let me decode that for everybody actually, a little bit. It's no yeah. ital. So there's no Italian loop, which is wolf, op, which is either an an ob or ops as in like the optics seat sight. So yeah, I see what you man. That's a they crazy. That is a crazy uh, green language that you just pulled out, but I, I understand slick speak. I just wanted to help everybody get there. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. And this is where the fang comes from. This is the original fang, you know. Uh, and this becomes a call sign. Uh, it goes to Sicily. It goes to well, the. If you go back to the Etruscans, the the oldest Italians that we know of, the Etruscans, they're Hades. AKA their Saturn, their Grim Reaper, their underworld god, winter god, was uh, represented by the wolf. They had their, the, uh, totally. and the priests, totally. the priests of that god, it's I'm blanking on his name for some reason. Uh, somebody in the chat will remind me, but the priests of that god actually, they would run around and like rob people. They, they wouldn't subsist on anything honest their entire thing was like like highway robbery and wearing wolf skins and they were wild dude yeah yeah buddy isn't that isn't that uh, what uh romulus was in, uh, wasn't in, he one of those robbers wasn't he one of the romulus and ramus what weren't they like i mean I one of the so, stories but, is that they were sucking from the wolf but mm -hmm. i think another one is that they were that they were part of that robber group of 
wolfskin wearing uh, barons. And now what we're in now is the descendant civilization of robbery. <laughs> yeah. And the, the God's name is Ata, yes, which is basically yes. the same word think... as Hades. It's just the H is dropped. Like I was talking about earlier or Kalu, which is Kali. We mm -hmm. Mario brought up Kali connected to uh, Saturn and the other name was Suri or Shuri, which is the same as like Surtur, the the Norse myth. So there's a lot to that god, Suri, Eta, Kalu, nice. but it's the wolf god. Right, right. So this Fang is a call sign I've seen in a, quite a few other places. Uh, Mod Gone, who is uh, in and of her own right, is like a modern day Joan of Arc of Ireland. She is the Banshee of Ireland. She was the muse of William B. Yeats, who yeeted Crowley down the stairs in the Battle of the Blythe. Blythe is uh, Bill Clinton's birth name. Uh, this Mod Gone character started a cult called uh, uh, Xing Fang. Xing Fang was her cult. The Xing Fang became a political movement that took over the majority in the UK in 2020 because they were uh, tip of the spear for health care. They took the majority, the uh, Shang, Fing, Shang Fing, Shang Fang, whatever they call it, is a hail sign to hail Fauci, hail the wolf, hail the wolf clan, whatever. And then one more, Nick Land is an accelerationist. Nick Land, one of the books that he's put on the map is Fane Numina. This, and he put it out in 2011. Well, that sure sounds like feigned pneumonia. That sounds a lot like fake pneumonia. Hey, everybody, the word's out, fake pneumonia. Okay, and it was nine years later that they popped off the uh, the according uh, operation, the no ITAL loop op uh, came to fruition. Uh, uh, and it was all uh, harnessing this word, this call sign. And then one more thing, Nick Land's full name, Nicholas Land, is an anagram for the Island Clan. And I think these guys are working in international waters. Gabe, I just pulled up Eta or Surrey or Kalu, just so you can see that the Etruscan Persephone has a snake crown. It's Medusa, baby. Yeah, buddy, Med USA, M E D. All caps, USA. Okay, so we're getting our way towards uh, about the two-hour mark. I know Kyle's uh, up late or up early, whatever that may be, and Michelle and Mario might have another engagement. So I want to make sure that, that the three of you get to put in any closing thoughts, you know, to, to close the loop here after we got off in the weeds on the lupus. Not good weeds, though. It's good stuff, Gabe. Um, I'll start. So I got, uh, earlier today when my mother-in-law was leaving the house to go play some cards, I let her know in Boca del Lupo, which is the, uh, cultural way of saying in the mouth of the wolf, which means not, uh, break a leg, have good luck. That's what you say to somebody to wish them luck in Boca del Lupo in the mouth of the wolf. Um, so there you go. Uh, um, so yeah, just going back to elderberry, um, and closing my thoughts on with elder, um, and this beautiful magic tree that I think is a great, um, example for polar symbolism, as we talked about a great example for that, uh, Saturnian farthest point of our visible consciousness, boundary medicine, what boundaries represent to us, what our emotional boundaries are, uh, the boundaries of our, the, uh, of, of what we, what we want to hold sacred, um, the structures that we build and want to sanctify, um, and the boundaries that are between organ systems in particular, um, all of that stuff is available to learn within this plant. Like we, we find, that it's uh it's really helpful for for all of those ideas and also with the with respect to understanding a cosmological uh, greater cosmology and our relationship with that in the natural world 
that's that's a, a great disciplinary um, aspect with the elder. I think that it's it's there for us to to learn. As far as discipline goes, it takes a lot of work to get elder medicine. Like it's um, it's abundant, but it takes a lot of time. Tick tock, tick tock, because it takes you have to take off all these little berries. And then once you're doing it, once you're in the zone and you're focusing on it, um, then all of a sudden there you are at your cent at your at your center once again. You know you're not doing anything anymore. You're just you've just been uh, taking little berries off very gently because if you squeeze them too too much, then they'll then they'll explode. So it takes a lot of concentration and time. And there you are. You return to your center, that hollow center that is the inviting spot into the underworld where you might see the fairy king go by on midsummer's night as the legends say by sitting underneath the elder tree and uh careful sitting underneath the elder tree especially if you're young they might take you in to the underworld and do whatever fairies do with kids and and uh even if they don't you might stain your your genes <laughs> and uh i think that these these um lessons are multi-layered and uh, available for all different aspects of understanding working with um nature and and reality and the re and you know the reality of ourself what what it means to detoxify what it means to heal what it means to break up the mucus and uh thank you all by the way i appreciate that um what it means to let go of that which is no longer serving you what it means to build your blood back up again so that you can um, have the nutritional needs that you need to detoxify from something like lead that's all available from elder it's an old old lesson and it's been uh it's been on the books for a long time and that's why it's a it's part of the first alphabet <laughs> allegedly at least uh something that people will argue over that might be one of the first. And um, so, yeah, that's my, my closing thoughts on Elder. I really, I think this has been super fun and of course, extraordinary <laughs> um, with this group. I really appreciate it. And I love uh, vibrant and with y'all really do. Thank you so much. Yeah, buddy, you gotta, you guys out, out there ought to support Kyle. I mean, if you came in late, he is in Italy right now. He started this stream at 2 a.m. It's the clock just rang four bells. It's 4 a.m. for him there. Hit up <laughs> Tip of Canoe Herbs. I'll put a I'll post a link in the chats. It's always going to be linked in the description and show notes. Get yourself something that maybe you know run him out of his elder stock. This is the time of year to be taking that. The whole rest of winter. I mean, it's good year round. But if you've never tried elderberry, do yourself uh, a favor and pick up some nail in my coffin <laughs> use the interverse coupon code 10% off Kyle what's the uh, nail in my coffin syrup about it's uh that's my super big time cough syrup it's uh <laughs> it's Capricornian pun corny right um <laughs> so elderberries we got some other herbs that are that are expectorant and they're helpful for breaking up mucus uh some sometimes that flavor is bitter sometimes that flavor is not necessarily agreeable this is medicine that you need it for when you need it when a lot of times you know michelle and, and i we both make elderberry syrup which is more uh everyday friendly and yummy and kids like it and things like that too so regular elderberry syrup the nail in my coffin it's uh it's what i call an oxymel it's vinegar extract and um uh honey extract and some other uh, some other uh, magical potion herbs like whorehound and elder the berry the black eye of the elderberry stir it up and put it into a bottle and nail in my coffin <laughs> so yeah, it's cor corny stuff but we have fun we i love i love making medicine and i love stirring up the good vibes it's like one of the things that i learned back in when i first started making medicine is that like you really got to hold your intention and focus when you're when you're making medicine on when you're working with when you're harvesting when you're um all that from from the very from the very point of meeting the plant um all the way down to 
handing the the bottle over to to the person or putting it in the mail it all gets in there but a point the real point that it's super duper important is when you're stirring it and that's when you create that vortex you know that that zero point where whew, you can really put your intentions into the to the stuff so i like to i have a, a a chant that i invoke it's something i learned it's sanskrit and i don't understand it but i i feel it it's one of those uh sanskrit chants that are made for uh really f feeling and not necessarily knowing what it is and boom, put that into the medicine yep thanks for asking there it is coffin shaped <laughs> your puns Shut your balls, good. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Dude, All right. That, yeah, man. That, that is such a good one. You know, I got a, I got something to, for this for this tincture. An idea came to my mind. And I, I wonder if there's a really solid there with this. Have you guys ever heard that in the in the womb, the baby's knees are in the eye sockets? Have you guys heard this? That the kneecaps actually originate from the same tissues that your eyeballs do, that is the last correspondence I would have made on my own. But it makes wild sense. If you think of the positioning of a fetus, you know, your hands come out of your face and there's actually five uh, nerve branches on your face that correspond with the branches of your fingers. But then that your knees come from these rings, your kneecaps come from this position. So cap pre corn might be a nod to the kneecap that is in your eyes before you crown before you're born and so there is like a real solid primordial thread to the eyeballs and the kneecaps uh and then the nail in the coffin thing um uh, that just may, kind of puts capricorn in a whole new life for me i really love that oh oh but okay 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 hold on this is where i was going are the kneecaps in that context because we know about the winter solstice and the three days that the sun and the and the alignments of it all it, are the boulders that are rolled away from the cave are those boulders your kneecaps just a thought the boulder have to rolled chime in away this. from the cave so that the christ could be born yes and that would be the nail in the coffin right the boulder would be the kneecap is what sealed your coffin Dude, that is fascinating, the knee, the kneecap eye thing, because I've been thinking about the kneecaps and the eyes. I can't remember where I first came across it, but there's a lot going on there, um, actually. We already talked about Capricorn corresponding to the knees. We already talked about Capricorn and Saturn relating to the devil card, I believe. If not, here we are. <laughs> so Capricorn relates to the devil card. In some older devil cards you will actually see eyes on the kneecaps. Ah. I have some cards that show this. So the devil has eyes on his kneecaps. And then the Hebrew letter correspondence for the devil card is ayin, which means I. So you're totally spot on, dude. That's a, that's an epic weave right there. Very, very interesting. I did not know that about wow. um, that placement with the fetus or the embryo. In yeah, and you know, sometimes I think these associations are they're they're we and we know that they're primordial, but I think they're harnessed with the intention of putting you in a primordial state, uh, so that subconsciously these connections, these threads of truth, uh, uh, are we're more receptive to these threads of truth. And I, another Whoever thing I gotta say, I just was one of those. That, uh, it was one. Of, it must have been one of those auto fellatio guys. You know, they figured this out. They could bend that far. Like, oh, my, my kneecap. <laughs> my kneecap fits in my eye socket. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so another another symbol I've picked up on recently is um is the torch, is a symbol of uh, of the particular little cherub. His name is a uh, it's a, the hardest name, but he's the marriage angel. He's holding a torch, and the torch is a symbol of receptivity. So when you go to a wedding reception, your torch is going to get lit. You're hoping to get catch the spirit of love. And maybe you'll find somebody out in the crowd that you can go and light this torch privately, right? So this wedding reception thing, kind of like throwing the flowers. 
Um, back to the fool card. That's why there's a the torch, part. a dove, and there's a torch, a dove, and a, a butterfly on the fool card. They're emblematic of the the marriage of Eros and Psyche, or Cupid and Psyche, or the breathing of the spirit of God, the Ruach, nice. the pneuma into the, the vessel or the body of man, and the metempsychosis, the spirit that goes from body to body. That's more the butterfly. So you brought up the fool card, so I thought we got to throw that yeah, in there. Um, can I pause mm -hmm. you for a second, Gabe? I really want to give Michelle and uh, Mario closing thoughts. And then I know we have some Carrie Mullis to talk about, so we'll do that too. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thanks, man. Um, I want to expand on uh, some of what Kyle was talking about as my final thought here. Um, regarding the center, you mentioned the center a couple times. That is like my spirit lights up even when I think about the center, my center, the center of Earth, the center of the universe. Um, and so that's of my sort of primary concern right now. It's where my research has been leading me, I feel like, for years. And I have to once again give credit to this thought to uh, Rene Ganon and his book, uh, Fundamental Symbols. And uh, I just recently received another one of his books, uh, Lord of the World. Sometimes it's republished as King of the World. He's a really fantastic author, too, because he breaks things down into articles and essays, really digestible stuff. But um, what I didn't realize is he really influenced a lot of people, you know, uh, over the years. And so one of the things he said, though, regarding the center, which he refers to as the supreme center, um, that the basic sort of understanding that I get is that the supreme center was lost, is lost, is concealed during the Dark Ages, what he calls, uh, right, the Kali Yuga. And that that is what is missing, is the symbolism, the spiritual framework that is sort of understood when you take the center into account, the world axis into account, um, the center of this domain, right? And so it's the center that's missing right now. And so if we were to ever return to a golden age, I believe that that is what would return is this understanding and acknowledgement of the center. And it's as wild I was... that the uh, heliocentric model gives you the galactic center that is in the direction of the centaur. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 100%. Um, so anyway, so I just wanted to mention that. So there, there's this relationship here, Saturn with the center. Um, and then now the center in today's modern world, no longer being understood. Um, but yet it's all over the place, right? Because we're talking about this early age, which he calls the primordial age, but once again, is just the, the Northern tradition, polar tradition, Hyperborean age. And so um, just wanted to throw that out there because I think that's really, really a fascinating sort of consideration is that that is what the dark ages represents is that this center is concealed. But uh, now I'll hand it off to Michelle. This was really fun. Thanks for having us. I love you guys. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful thoughts, everybody. Love it. And uh, my final thoughts with Elder, you know, I find that there's beauty in the darkness. And I think that that's what Elder represents a lot of, to me anyway. And kind of leaning into your own darkness, looking at Elder as when I look at Elderberry syrup made with the black Elderberries, it is like a scrying mirror. There is the reflection that comes from the dark color of the shot of elderberry that's asking you to kind of look within. And that's what Saturn wants you to do. Going back to the center, going back to your inner wisdom, tapping into your inner crone or your inner grandfather energy, whichever you want to call it. Um, I think that's what Elder wants us to do. And Elder can be really supportive too during times of, you know, grief and trauma and loss when you're feeling out of sorts, when you feel uh, dark and, and you're going through something that's tough, you know, elder can actually come in like a hug. I feel like, like a grandmother hug. That's that crone energy, the in embrace and the boundary that can, you know, be created around you when you're feeling that way. Cause sometimes a lot of times when you're feeling out of sorts or you're going through something tough, all you sometimes feel like you need is a hug, but maybe you don't have someone to hug you, but maybe it's elder and <laughs> maybe you need to have elder come and hug you. And, um, one of the other things I wanted to 
to mention is that elder, the berries can also be used as a fabric dye. And I was given this beautiful scarf that was dyed with elderberry and it's, you, it might not come through online, but it's just like a really beautiful, like, um, light purple color. And so remembering that plants can be used for things like that as well for dyeing fabrics and having a ritual cloth for your altar or something like that. And I think elders are really, would be a really good place to start if somebody's interested in doing that. So that's what I have to say, but thank you guys for having us or thank you chance for having us. And thank you guys for hanging out and sharing all your wisdom as always. It's a good time. Thank you. I love you guys. This was a lot of fun. So any of you think of uh, a good reason for us to weave again as a unit on any subject, I'm, I'm there. The, the door is always open. Now, anybody that needs to go or anything, feel free <laughs> and wave goodbye or just pop in and say bye. Otherwise, I'm going to just drive us through a couple more things that I have on my agenda. First of all, all right, the uh, Michelle and Mario taking off. Much love you, too. Oh, wait, you wait before great. you guys go. Wait, 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 wait. Before you go, I want to congratulate Michelle on her se uh, second Crow episode. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for doing oh, one yeah. on pets. If anybody if anybody missed Michelle's, uh, her resurgence onto the Crow crew, go get some of that. That was an awesome, uh, you found a niche uh, inside of a niche that is like unique and oh that was such a charming episode so I would just want to big up you and also uh, I want to get closer to your limelight hey everybody I know this girl <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah, I feel that way about you all we hang so. out we hang out I know Michelle <laughs> <laughs> no you guys are great and thank you Gabe yeah I, I mean that is seriously one of my favorite topics to talk about is particularly natural cat care because I have a lot of experience in it, uh, but I'm really glad you liked it. And it was super fun to talk to those guys because Crow and Jason and Rose are all pet lovers. They all have pets themselves. And, you know, we had a good discussion, I think, about, you know, what are some options for our pets and the way that we're, you know, how the system treats them. It's very crazy it's it's really nuts so yeah i recommend people listening to that if you're into that sort of thing and also i finally um dropped my i have a handbook for um it's a guide for herbal and natural cat care and it's a pdf that i wrote it's on my website uh you can purchase it and download it it's something i've wanted to write for a long time and this ep the episode with those guys actually just like threw me into the the burn the fire and do it let's uh let's get it out there so we just completed it last night yeah Yep, you can find it on my store, and I'm super, super pumped for it, and I hope it helps a lot of pets and a lot of pet owners out there, particularly cat owners, because that's what it's all about, cats. <laughs> cats and how you can care for them with herbs and natural remedies. Nice. Thank you. And I, yeah. And I got, I got one thing I want to share with Mario. I want to try to make him jealous because he's got such an awesome book collection. Look what I got, bro. What's up? What's up, Kirk Collenbach? Excellent. This was a nice. gift from I... uh, from the House of Garton. Ooh, sweet, sweet. <laughs> you you deserve to have that, man. That that belongs to you for sure. Everybody on screen, I sent them a book for Christmas. So Merry Christmas, friends. Love you all. Right on. All right, guys. E enjoy the rest of the stream. We'll talk to you soon. See you, see you later. Bye, Happy guys. birthday. Bye -bye. Ah, thank you. Coming up on big old four zero. That's nice. right. That's right. <laughs> powerful. The powerful Michelle and Mario. See you guys. Love you guys. Right. Check you later. Bye, Bye, -bye. guys. So thank you, Gabe, for reminding us all that uh, Michelle was on Crow again. That's going to be in my ears tomorrow morning, I think, at the gym. Now, while we got everybody, before we wrap up, uh, there's something I wanted Gabe to talk to us about. And then also... I think this is a great time for us to do the astrology for 2024 Emily Ridout course giveaway of sorts. So um, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to pull a screen share up of a random number generator. Currently, this is the best way that I know how to do it. <laughs> so the random number generator is going to be 1 to 2024. 
1 through 2024. Guess a number between 1 and 2024 if you would like to get yourself a uh, the secret to how to get a free ticket to Michelle, or not Michelle, Emily's Astrology for 2024 course. So pop it into the live chat. I'm only looking at the YouTube version. Sorry, everybody else. Um, just how it is. Actually, you know what? I'll look at Rockfin too. I've got Rockfin open. So if you put that in the chat, um, at the after Gabe is done weaving his weave that I'm going to bring up an image for, I will go through and see which one's the closest, and I will screen share whenever I do the random number generation. So I already see some in there. In there, do not guess more than once. If I see somebody with two numbers in there, you're immediately disqualified because it's just that's not in the spirit of of uh, fair play. So that's that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Gabe, you had sent me this image. I wanted to let you unpack it while we let everybody catch up in the stream and guess their number for the astrology course giveaway. And where is my chat with you? Okay, so Gabe, take it away, bud. I'm going to pull this up. Because this is All so, right. <laughs> I know Carrie Mullis has been uh, on your so mind and we brought up clues. Into- Here we go. Yeah, man. Yeah. So this is a this is a black pill seashore scavenger hunt. (laughs) And what we're going to do is we're going to walk with Christ on the sand and we're going to track our footsteps and we're going to watch very carefully where we step. Because the psychology of man has been deeply inseminated with hazards and warnings and triggers and things that go ouch on your feet, particularly around calamities and disasters. Um, And it's so subtly seeded into our language. It is really something to marvel at. Um, So I've tapped into a bit of a muse. I think... Um, It unpacks very much out of the aquatic ape theory. The aquatic ape theory is that 10 tribes, renegade uh, tribes that thought they could do it on their own, that they could go into the wilderness and fortune would favor them. Uh, That's a that's a purple uh, fortune card nod right there. These 10 tribes would go uh, along the seashore and they are eating all of these mollusks clams they're very shellfish they're taking in sea urchins they see the urchins and there's a sense of emergency the 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 word play around this uh the spell is ancient it's like the oldest subtle uh calamity spell uh and it's it just bridges across so many words around uh watching your step cuidado caution Take care. Um, uh, even the word emergency, you know, it has the uh, me and sea urchins hiding in it. Uh, I actually, let me see if I have a, my list of, yeah, here it is. The list of words is just wild. The word sack crayfish, right? And also uh, there's entire religious orders out there who, you know, shellfish is forbidden uh, and highly regulated. And if you want to get it at certain times of year, you have to be uh, in the know with certain people. Carrie Mullis is supposed to be some sort of savior. He's supposed to be some sort of high ideal, uh, 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 somebody who speaks their language, who's like a go-between for us, who is going to be a mouthpiece for fighting the good fight against science. And it turns out I am finding that he is a heavily in he's heavily seeded with thelemic iconography and i'm going to get this book i'm going to buy this book but i'm buying this book uh almost because i think it will tell me more about my thoth deck than it will tell me anything about what really happened to humanity Hmm. and i'm very passionate if you can tell about that the polymers chain reaction process has three phases to it denaturation annealing and elongation 
Those are wow. visual puns for the three types of Magus cards that are on offer in every deck. You get you can choose your favorite of these three of these three cards. I'm here to tell you that these were ritualistically inseminated into our generation. These are keystones of our generation, and they're going to pop these cards whenever they need your blood to start pumping and get your desires, your sense of uh, of need, your Malthusian uh, lack mentality will kick in when these triggers come up. So I want everybody to be on your toes around this spell. A kneeling. It's obvious. I don't have to say anything. The picture says it all. Jim and I soda. That whole, that whole spell was a mass homunculus phase two of the operation. So let me point out to the uh, denaturation. It means the breaking of bonds. Mm -hmm. Just so people like can kind of wrap Fuck. their head around what this process might look like in culture. So the breaking of bonds and then Annealing is like a to heat something up and then cool it down. So this is the pendulum that they do, like they rile you up and then they chill you out. You know, like the um, <laughs> you get it. Like you see this through media all the time. There's definitely a heating up and then cooling down, heating up then cooling down. The annealing process is for sure there. So anyway, that's denaturation, breaking bonds, annealing, heating, and cooling. Yes. And one of my favorite jokes for a couple of years was somebody was saying, I'm just waiting for the for the uh, whatever scandal around Elon Musk to pop off so we could finally start using the word elongate. Ha, 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 ha. What the fuck? That joke happened like, I think, eight years ago. And I was like, yeah, elongate. When that happens, I'm ready for the joke. Holy shit, y'all. Holy shit. That was a thelemic encode. Holy shit. Elongate. Is what uh, and not only that, it is encoded in um, uh, Ruth Bat Gins. Ruth Bat Gins is an anagram for Heidegger's book, uh, Being in Time. Uh, being and uh, the one before Being in Time, maybe. Uh, but, anyways, her, that statue is the elongation, elongation statue. It had the crazy ears and the crazy arms coming out, just like this card here. Um, and sure enough, Elon was uh, stringing us all through a, a, a maze of controversy. Okay. Uh, but what's really punching me in the face is that the phrase polymers chain reaction PCR is an anagram for polyhymnia's CERN rhetorica NPC. This would sound like nonsense to anybody who has not been studying the Ars Notoria actively in learning about the power of rhetoric, the power of the, um, the rhapsodes, and the power of the gesticulation, talking with my hands, which I'm guilty of before I read these these uh, these gimmicks. I used to talk with my hands before that. So now I'm more self-conscious about it. But polyhymnia is the muse of speech, uh, of rhetoric, essentially. Rhetoric is the, uh, the Latin version. Polyhymnia is the Greek version. It is profound that they're covering their bases in multiple languages, that they're saying the same idea, but in culturally, they're saying it in, uh, in the ancient ways, and then the middle ways in the new the new accumulation of this technology we call NPCs. People who obey rhetoric, we call them NPCs. These are three generations of people who don't think for them damn selves. And it was hiding out with the muse of those people who assume, who listen to the voices from the from the whatever from the main mind's dream media, as I call it. Gabe, there's, then, there's precedence you, of the uh, R and the N swapping between some languages. So as far as letter swaps go, you can occasionally consider an N and an R swap. So PCR and NPC, same three letters in a way. True, true. Uh, but I actually borrowed that in from the anagram of polymer's chain reaction theory. Like, I don't think there's any missing letters. Uh, this is like, I'm I'm not doing this, uh, the slick dissident stretches here i think i'm pretty 
uh, I'm like, if I if I missed any letters, it was a mistake. I'll say that. I think I got them all. I checked this a, a few times. Totally, but you um, know the what so I yeah, say that the for is, is actually the, borrowed from the NPC earlier. people were like you know constantly taking PCR tests. It was a way during cooties to know if somebody was uh, I, metaphorically an NPC. I don't oh. believe anybody's an NPC, right? But you know, acting as if they were the ones constantly right. taking PCR. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, you're so right. You're so right. And oh man, th there's something really huge there. Uh, there's a, br so the, they're going through the drill. They know the drill. They are attuned to this swirling mixing of where weirds, <laughs> these mixing of weirds. Uh, Kyle, earlier you were talking about stirring the cauldron. And I think there really is something hypnotic about implying the double helix. And guess what? In, uh, in Gnostic, like Philip K. Dick world, guess what they call people who are NPCs? Their term for them are the helixes. They call NPCs the helix people. And that's a controversial term. I'm probably fucking it up. It might be like the heloys or something like that with a silent X, I think. Um so the helix, those who believe in DNA, those who are, woo, woo, their minds are spinning out, uh, they're going to obey the polyhymnia. They're going to be very receptive to the rhetoric. And we are going to label them as NPCs. And I don't like that. I don't like, I don't like, a, somehow there's a superiority reflex in my mind. I don't like having a superiority reflex uh, uh, supplemented to me. I like to come to my superiority complexes on my own, naturally. I don't like them to be uh, fostered by uh, showmanship. Uh, can you go to the top of that uh, of that picture, Chance? There was a, this gets really wild. I'll just, I'll be very quick and expedient. People can go on this search on their own. I am going to get this book and get some details dug out. Carrie Mullis had a psychedelic vision that, uh, that a radioactive raccoon told him how to, whatever, uh, go to the next level. He was on psychedelics openly. So he is saying, I won the Nobel Peace Prize because a glowing raccoon told me I have success. I am, uh, he was uh, very prideful of his success. So the raccoon becomes his demonic spirit uh, of, of sorts. Uh, but raccoon is the anagram for Corona. So his own biography is prophesizing the collapse of the apocalypse. It's all bullshit. This whole, this entire thing, he is bullshit. I don't think he really exists or anything that we could ever expect to count on out of this book. We'll have any, we'll have any value that hasn't been anticipated already. That's why I'm getting this book. I think that these arguments are paving the way for us to hit a wall because I think this is all uh, very uh, masterfully crafted. Okay. And then last thing. So yeah, so I put Rocket Raccoon on his shoulder because he had a glowing rac raccoon. This is an old picture of, um, of remember Mercury changing people's mind with his magical words? So they are so chained to their brains. Uh, well, the, his shoes in this picture are in the shape of the R Altair. He's changing their minds, altering their minds. He has two shoes in the shape of R Altair constellation. That was pretty fun for me. And then the last thing on this weave, Oh, and keep in mind, the metaphor of him walking on the beach and being a surfer, uh, riding the, the tides, um, that is intrinsic to the vanity of uh, uh, Aphrodite on the half shell. And that's kind of part of how I picked up on this. I'm actually, uh, I find these seashells because I listen to my vanity. I listen to the, the, the vain ear picks up on these, uh, these funny little... Uh, uh, whatever, linguistical gimmicks that, that I've discovered. But what's wild is that there is right now, there is a new psychological theory circulating. I think it's going to get really big. It might be bigger than I know. And it's uh, called polyvagal theory. And sure enough, polyvagal theory is, uh, it's a with that one, it's a stretch, but it lines up, uh, the explanation of the process lines up with the three steps of the polyhymnia CERN rhetorica NPC spell that it has three phases uh, going from denaturing to annealing and then into elongating metaphorically. And so I think there's a huge disclosure right here on this graphic.
the things you just said, <laughs> what, okay. Like if I was going to encapsulate it in a nutshell, I think there's a lot of value I'm perceiving in understanding these three steps as a part of some kind of fractal that expresses itself through human behavior and human interaction with the world. Maybe, maybe not something that actually exists in the natural world, maybe a version of it. But to me, it, like my first sense on this is that it ha this is some kind of pattern that expresses when humans try to do something to the natural world to alter it or try to alter e each other, <laughs> things like that. You know, like this is, this may be something related to artifice. And then, you know, the considering the world as a created entity itself, maybe there's something in the grander macrocosmic pattern that expresses here too. I, I'm going to have to think about this. Uh, really good, really good weave, man. Kyle, you want to weigh in on that? Uh, nope. <laughs> I'm looking over here at my, at the shells. And I'm thinking about the conch showing showing me some noise. I'm thinking about um, the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, it's uh, there's a I think it's chapter thirty. There's a um, a master temple incense recipe, and in this recipe that people um, try to replicate, there's an ingredient called O N Y C H A. I don't know how to pronounce that. But that looks like an anagram. <laughs> O-N-Y-C-H-A. Oincha. And it's purported to be shells, like this particular type of shell. The word, I believe, means like fingernail or something fingernail-like or something like that. Um, and so for the longest time, I was like, I, I really want to replicate this temple incense, even though it says not to. Uh, unless it's only for the temple, but so I got some. Uh, I got some of this uh, oin oincha, on on onikya, and um, some some of these shells that modern scholars, I guess, repute this is the this is what they're talking about. And I burned it, and it smells like what burning shells smell like it's awful it's like it smells like burning hair burning fingernails or whatever and um everything else in the recipe is like frankincense and cinnamon and myrrh and things that are have this lovely incense flavor and so i'm like i don't i don't know i can't I, there's something about that that really uh that came to mind when you were talking about the the um the breaking of the bond and the annealing. Um, I'm thinking about this shell and I'm thinking about the, the incense and the burning in the temple. And uh, anyway, I don't have much, much else. There's it's that just comes to mind. So the con the con showing me noise right now, there is pointing my mind in that, <laughs> in that direction. <laughs> well, you just put some really interesting future research into on my plate about, regarding incense and the ingredients for it and what that might tell us because this uh anika <laughs> anike how, onyx is the same word as onyx interestingly enough uh, just the wikipedia page alone on this we're already seeing murex <laughs> molas you know all of these th ingredients of the the priesthood and the yep the royalty coming into the weave really interesting yep gabe and i we've been good we got one of our touchstones is a f is this illustration of a priest touching a stone he's uh he's the the one of the high priest of and he's got the breastplate with the 12 uh different gemstones in it and and he's holding his palm on the granite as uh, gabe has um decoded before and out of the sensor of incenses, uh, the, the smoke is moving in a particular direction. And it seems like there's some other scribes that are behind this fellow that are kind of taking note of the procedure and making sure it's done right, but also maybe clarifying the direction 
of the smoke um, and using that as a, a divinatory a divinatory example in that fool card where we have to walk that straight line um, and we and with the nature of a line is not something that you find in nature. And so finding that balance, being able to keep your steps in front of you like the tracker. Um, but, um, you know, in, when it comes to nature, there is no such thing as a straight line. So, um, if you're walking on top of the sand dune, um, or across a, a balance beam and in, in, or something like that, or in snow, anyway that that all comes to mind so uh that is a great great weave and i and i and i definitely see you're on the uh forefront of unpacking something bigger and deeper with this the pcr spell that i think um you know that that spell got busted up but um you're right you know when when we go into that um when we go into that world to um to look at their their fallacies I think it's designed in that Nietzschean sort of trap to um, to bind us into that into that world. Into there's there's a wall there. Like it's uh, you could you could tell there's the, if we're talking about magic that's been seeded since Machiavelli <laughs> and the mouth of the wolf and uh, and the fangs of the wolf. That it's it's uh, anyway. I don't have much more to say about it. I'm, my mind is blown. <laughs> and His fading. Mind is gravy. <laughs> yeah. uh, they call that on onyx shell in the Hebrew. I'm just looking into it because it's fascinating. They call it shekela. Shin Chet Lamed Tav. So S C L T. And that word apparently means a lion's roar something like that or a word related to uh man this is such a strange definition shekeleth peeling off by concussion of sound what peeling off by concussion of sound i'm just thinking of like your skin getting peeled off in the spaghettification and loki that it's been on my mind but apparently when the torah got translated into the septuagint the word in Greek, onika, which means fingernail or claw, was substituted for shekeleth. But man, peeling off by concussion ultrasound, sound, like yeah, like an ultrasound. What does that have to do with incense? Peeling off by concussion of sound. We're off in the weeds. I'm gonna do our. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do our uh, giveaway now. You don't. You don't. Oh. Oh. All right. Oh. One, oh. one, one thought that comes up with Shekelet in the concussion is uh, ultrasound, MK ultrasound. And I've had a theory that they're actually catching a fingerprint of you when you get your first ultrasound. That's the first time you become subject matter. And, uh, and they don't need mom to inform on you. They know more than mom at that point. And I think we all have a unique fingerprint. And that could be a, a silent name. That could be used as a silent name. Your placental imprint could be uh, like in a crowd of music, your signature could be in the music. And you'd be the only one picking up on that. I'm just saying they, they, there's an address to what the shekeleth might mean in the context of ultrasound. You realize that fingerprint scanners like for biometrics, for security and stuff are ultrasound. What you just, I wondered if you knew that. Did you know that? They use, like, you put your thumb or your finger on the thing, scan, you're coming in the building. It's literally it uses ultrasound to map the ridges of the finger. Yeah. So maybe <laughs> you might be right about that. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this, I mean, the theory, it, it, it holds on its own, but like, okay, it's not natural. They, okay, we have this naturally. You have a divine twin. You have this this externalization. Sometimes it's a it's a few people. Sometimes it's a, your mom. Sometimes it's your girlfriend. Where you have a theoretical conversation with somebody who's not there. That projection is all ours naturally. I wonder if they're uh, making a false overlay. I'll just say that. Okay, I'm going to do the giveaway <laughs> before we lose. 
where we lose too many people. Um, not that this isn't interesting, but you know, getting later. So here we have a random number generator. Just gonna refresh the screen. You can all see this is legit. I'm typing in one to 2024. We're gonna do this twice. So I'm gonna, and not a lot of people guessed. So whoever's closest on each one, I'm gonna give the the secret to the astrology course being you know comped. So first, 1957. All right, that's a nice number. Okay, I am looking through the chat. And I see a 1969 from Jason Talbot. And that looks like the winner. So, Jason, if you're still here, email me, chance at interversepodcast.com. Please email me sometime this evening or because the, the course is tomorrow. And I will send you the secret. Uh, if I don't hear from you, I'm going to give it to somebody else that is in this chat. Okay. And now, number two. 1060. Okay. Scrolling up. Hmm. There's an 1161. Hmm. I think that, I think that takes it. All right. <laughs> All right. 1161 from word nerd poetry, hot air balloon. That is her uh, nom de jour. It, I'm pretty sure it's a female. <laughs> Much love. Uh, send me an email, chance at interversepodcast.com. If you got to make a new email address with a brand new name, <laughs> so be it. But I want to give you the freebie to attend to that class. Uh, so, yeah, email me and you guys will get the uh, the code to get your course. Everyone else, if you are interested in only $20 to get a, an hour on from a master astrologer on the 2020, 20, 2020, 2020, 2024. <laughs> stuff here we go it's emilyredout.com go check her out she's great other than that i'm gonna take off guys we're, we're out of here it's been a fun time kyle thanks for staying up to do this Ciao. it's been great thanks chance thanks gabe it's always fun to play play in the in the herb walks with you <laughs> uh tunings are book are filling up pretty fast too so if you guys want to do some oh ooh, okay we're gifting it to rachel awesome thanks word nerd poetry hot air balloon you're the best all right so I'll be in touch with everybody uh, that sends me the email for their code. And I am out of here. Get a tuning. Book it. Running out of spots. February is starting to fill up. If you want it, let's do it. They've been great. Can't even tell you how great. <laughs> it takes you long, but totally crushing. Uh, everybody that's getting a tuning is totally crushing. Oh, how about this? How about this? I'll read a, a recent message I got permission to read from a uh, a recent cl tuning client who says, I, hello, Chance. I really enjoyed the tuning ceremony. The enthusiasm you had was so fun. I felt the anger I had leave me and a big weight has been lifted off me. I had a few moments after, but now I have a clarity that I haven't had in years. My wife and daughter see a big difference and I'm super excited about the present and the future. I'm grateful for this and you. I will be scheduling another one in the near future. Uh, Hearing success stories all the time. Just want to make sure you guys know that. So get yourself tuned. We're out of here. See you guys soon for a Loki stream. Might be tomorrow. Feel like it probably will be. Uh, so a little off our normal schedule, but we got to get these weaves in. They're hot. Yeah, get forked by get forked by chance. Thank you, Stacy. And uh, good night to all. You know, Merry Christmas. Good night. Much love. Happy New Year. See you soon. Much love, love y'all.